join us on the Path Radio Mix online. And to get there, type in thepathradio.com. That's thepathradio.com. And enjoy free streaming music all day long. That's it. thepathradio.com. All right, now let's get to the main show, the monthly social podcast with me, your host, Guido Perino, as you go on with Guido. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the August podcast. I got a fun-filled show for you again, kicking things off with Canadian music producer Mark Zubek from Zed Records. We're going to hear from Tanya Tusa, debut song, Get Down To It. Sticking with musical guests, we have the Mystic Fools in a two-part interview and two songs from them as well. We're going to hear about Mr. Fellini's Apple. We're going to do Laughter Yoga with Kathy Nesbitt. And then end things off with four fans talk sports in a heated conversation before, of course, we close the show off with some music and get lit. Stay tuned, folks, and let's go! All right, before we get started today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about one of our Promote Ontario slash Canada small businesses. Johnny Prosciutto, artisanal Italian homemade products. We make it like our grandfather, or as we say, no, no. Naturally cured, old-fashioned, and delicious. The best part? We deliver straight to your front door. We offer free shipping when spending over $99. Order online at johnnyprosciutto.com and stay safe. And when you use the code GOGUIDO, you're going to save $25 off your entire order. That's the code GOGUIDO on johnnyprosciutto.com. So if you haven't heard or participated yet, the Go On With Guido podcast friends are bringing you a winning summer opportunity. What that means is that we've got a summer contest. So at the end, by the end of August, we have a giveaway. We're giving away two prosciuttos from Johnny Prosciutto. We're giving away six liters of fresh citrus juice of your choice from Chaser's Juice. Two music CDs from Billboard artist Franklin McKay. Two cool t-shirts, a red and a blue. Uh, that shows some Canadian pride from uh, the podcast itself. So what do you have to do to enter? Bunch of different opportunities for you. One, either follow at Go On With Guido on Twitter. That'll get you an entry. You find the post on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook for the contest. And you like and share it. And that'll give you five entries. Or you subscribe to the Go On With Guido podcast on any podcast platform. And that'll give you 10 entries. All you got to do there is send me a screenshot of which platform you subscribe to and you email it to goguido at guidoperino.com. That's a fantastic deal. And you don't have to do all of those things. You could do any one of those things for different uh, possibilities of, of entries. There's no purchase necessary. Just do any one of those things. Head over to guidoperino.com, click the little contest button, get more information, eat, drink, and be merry with prosciutto, citrus juice, listening to music, and wearing some cool t-shirts. Check it out, folks. Have some fun with it. I'd like to welcome to the podcast multiple award-winning Canadian songwriter, jazz musician, and music producer, Mark Zubek. Mark has a long list of accomplishments from winning songwriting contests like being a three-time winner of the John Lennon Song Contest, two-time winner of the International Songwriting Competition, winner of the USA, Billboard, and UK Song Contest. He's worked on theme songs that are on the USA Network, La Dolce Vita on the Food Network. Sorry, I had to say (laughs) it that way. (laughs) TV shows like Degrassi and Debra. Shared a stage with Katy Perry on Entertainment Tonight. Performed at the Apollo Theater, the White House, man, and so much more. I, I could keep talking. I'd never get to hear Mark. You'd never get to hear Mark. So let's get there. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks for being here. It's a treat to have you on the Go On With Guido podcast. How are you today? Oh, pretty good. Uh, thank you for having me, Guido. It's a pleasure to be here. You, uh, you've been having a rocking sort of day or you playing music? Um, yeah, yeah, I've been, um, yeah, just, uh, working by myself today on, um, 
vocal comps and that sort of thing. Production, music production. Right on, right on. Sounds sounds uh, sounds cool. Did you? Um, what's your? You know, just before we get going, what's your favorite instrument, Mark? Oh man, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> but uh, no, maybe I do because I'm a drummer first, uh-huh. and um, and when I'm watching any band, I usually just focus on the drummer. So I guess I'll be the drums. So you, it's the rhythm, right? You got the rhythm of the drum. Yeah, I guess so. Right on. I guess so. <laughs> Hey, so listen, you, you've you got quite a diverse set of, of musical accomplishments. I Like, I'm listing those things off. I feel like I'm, I'm announcing somebody, you know, walking down to the ring with all those all those, uh, yeah, yeah. All those tags and everything. But we're going to get into some of those. Um, but I'd like to ask, you know, and I usually kick this off. I say, hey, you know, um, being a musician and a producer, was that something that you set out to be, like, from an early age? Or, or you know, did you mutually find each other along the way as... Sometimes those sorts of things happen in life, or was there a trigger that you can? That you yeah, can well, it's kind of both, and, and I think it, it was happening before I knew what was happening or whatever. So I come from a musical family. My uncle, in particular, um, he he's uh, he's uh, we're Ukrainian, so he's he does what I do in the Ukrainian community. So I kind of grew up um, just watching him and his band, and, and he always had a studio as well. And, um, and I ended up being his drummer from when I was twelve, and. Um, He'd uh, give me his hand-me-down equipment and stuff. He'd give me like a, an old four-track cassette and a mixer and this and that. So I guess I just I fell into it in that like it was such a cool thing to do to be able to record and overdub and, and to play a couple instruments and put put stuff together. So I didn't know what I was doing, but I was really doing what I do now for a living. But, but I didn't know that's what it was called or anything, you know. So you you kind of had all this. Ex- you were you were building experience that you don't know you were building. Yeah, exactly. Did you say did you say eight track at one point or did I hear that right? Uh, it was a four track, a four, four track, track cassette. Yeah. Wow. So it's kind of like family business, and uh, hand me downs, family business. Learn yeah. learn the tools of the trade. Now you said your uncle did he do this in Ukraine? Uh, no, he's Canadian, but he's like if you're so if you're you know born in the 50s and, and you're ukrainian in north america you know my uncle he's, 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 he's a guy he, he plays a lot of ukrainian music and he's probably played your your, your uncle's wedding or something like that so uh i played a lot of weddings and dances and stuff with him, uh, from like 12 to 17. so oh so you were you were you were playing you were playing from 12 to 17 live yeah it was uh, for him yeah oh right on um so so twelve to seventeen. Take me, take me from that. I mean, um, you kind of get the instruments. It's part of the family. You're learning to play drums, but I understand that that you were discovered by jazz singer Betty Carter, who you collaborated yeah. with. Um, like this, this is Betty, mm-hmm. like Betty, but beautiful. There is no greater love. Make it last, Betty yeah. Carter. How how do you <laughs> how do you go from playing, you know? weddings at 12 to 17 to getting discovered by betty carter and then and i guess part two of that what does it yeah. mean for you to have have that happen and, and to work with her oh man that was crazy i was i was young i was 18 years old um but like i guess rewind to how it all kind of works together because uh, yeah. my uncle has a part of that too actually is that um you know i, I played drums where i was eight i got my parents bought me a drum set finally well, after begging them for years <laughs> they bought me a drum set when i was eight and uh, I guess by the time I was 12, I got good enough and I was playing with my uncle uh, regularly, like on Saturday nights and stuff. Um, but I was, uh, I, I played keyboard as well. And he'd give me, like I said, he'd give me his four track. So I had a synthesizer that was like 11 or, and I had a four track and a mixer. And, and I'm just trying to record stuff. And I'd work with the singers in school. I went to an arts high school. So, you know, you got the, the people in the vocal choral program or whatever and get get them to come over and write a song together and just really do what i end up doing today so it's really i don't know i, I kind of fell into all of it um and um so I, I i took up guitar and bass when i was about 14 or 15 because i was sick of trying to make the keyboard sound like a guitar or bass <laughs> <laughs> so um i play electric guitar electric bass and then my uncle got this got this upright bass and I've been learning jazz music because um, I thought that was really interesting. And um, They had an upright bass at high school, which I played a few times. It's really the same as an electric bass. It's just bigger. And um, but I was really getting into that. And this 
these guys from Ukraine uh, came over to record with my uncle and they wanted to um, sell them all their instruments after because they wanted the cash. <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> around 1990 or something. And they, uh, so yeah, my uncle bought their instruments from me. This is upright bass, and he was going to paint it white and put it in the corner. And I begged him not to. Like, no, oh, give me that bass. I don't buy it off you. <laughs> and uh, and I fell into that instrument because it's it's unique, you know. Like, um, there there aren't so many players. So when I was in school, there was a thousand guitar players in the school, and there was thirty upright bass players. So you kind of by default. <laughs> you kind of, if you're any even somewhat good, you end up working a lot, you know. So, um, yeah, I guess how, that's how upright bass came to be. And I went to Berkeley after high school, and yeah, long story short, Betty Carter discovered me there through a teacher. I just gave a teacher, one of my teachers is Billy Pierce, who's he was in the Art Blakey Jazz Ensemble. He's a star jazz performer himself. He was yeah. one of my teachers. I just gave him like a set that I made with the guys at school. Um, I don't know why he passed it to Betty Carter, but he did. And, and uh, Betty Carter asked uh, asked me and the, the members of my band there, we were all young kids at Berkeley, and she asked us all to perform with her. And, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it was pretty cool. And, and uh, she had an act for really hiring young musicians and giving them a chance. That was kind of her thing. She oh, that's cool. Her. Yeah. So did you actually did you actually have to audition for her? Or like she just listened to the tape and then said, "Hey, Mark, come and play." Or or did you have to do another? Demo? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just that. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, and wow. bring all your guys and um, and they're 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 doing this big jazz showcase where they asked, she asked a couple of other groups of people and and there was this big uh, thing at the Apollo Theater. And we all performed with her and uh, separately. And, and, so uh, yeah, it's it a great thing. So your first show with Betty Carter was at the Apollo Theater. Uh, I think the first one was at the Brooklyn Majestic Theater. Either way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, did you, yeah, so, cool. so thinking back, like, did you, being in that moment, were you like, hey, I'm on stage with Betty Carter and I'm doing this? Or was it yeah. just playing and then sometime later you went, hey, I just did that? Like, uh, Probably a bit of both. I don't know. It's <laughs> such a whirlwind thing. Like, I grew up in Mississauga. <laughs> And I went to an arts high school, and then, like, you know, I end up in Boston going to school, and then, you know, I'm wow. taking the bus to New York a lot. To, and it's all like kind of a whirlwind, right? I mean, I was 18. I don't really remember <laughs> what kind of a. Yeah, it sounds crazy thinking back in that now, but yeah, I'm sure. I was very excited for sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm ex I'm still it's excited for you just listening to that, yeah. right? It's kind of cool. Um, so you've mentioned jazz a couple of times, and and um, you've made a couple of jazz records of your own. And uh, I I got it. I was intrigued. I was intrigued by the names Horse with a Broken Leg and, <laughs> right. uh, and Twenty Two Dollar Fish Lunch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's just hard to name instrumental jazz music. There's no lyrics, so I mean, <laughs> what do you call it? Right? <laughs> well, I so we're gonna go down this path here. Like, but you're also like I, you're also influenced by other genres like pop, rock, R and B. You're into hip hop, like. And, yeah. and it seems you've dabbled in 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 writing some small jingles for for companies like Coca Cola and and, and Dunkin' Donuts and, and even the Discovery Channel. By the way, this is like the I, I this is not a planned thing, but it seems yeah. like the fourth episode, like this is the fourth or fifth episode that Coca Cola has come up. And every time I say oh. their name, I keep saying, "Hey, if they ever want to sp offer us any sponsorship, I'm I'm oh, yeah. open to it." But um, even send me a bottle of Coke, Coke. But sorry, I had to throw <laughs> that in there. I don't know. It's just it's so weird. It's like every guest we talk to is like, "Oh, Coca Cola works its way into it." Sorry, I digress. Yeah. Um, so yeah. a few questions I want to unpack here. So, what's the story behind the naming of those records? Horse with a broken leg and twenty two dollar fish lunch. Like, I I want to I want to know if there's something else. Is there something behind those things? Yeah, there's so. Um... The one horse with a broken leg is that is the, is the name of a song as well. So it's like the right. title track of the song, and that was just simple. That was coming up with like uh, the trumpet player um, when I was rehearsing the song with him, and I didn't, you know, I didn't have a title. And he's like, "Oh, this is this is interesting. It's it has such a groove, but it's it's disjunct and it's you know it's messed up. It's like a horse with a broken leg. And I'm like, oh, it's hilarious. <laughs> I just be laughing. I thought it was funny. Like, there you go." <laughs> So it came through. It came through just some casual conversation and kind of dissecting what the song sounded like. Yeah, I guess so. All right, so it got <laughs> it got legs that way. I got it. Yeah, got it. <laughs> the twenty the twenty two dollar fish lunch was um, a different thing. That's a little more elaborate. Um, I, so I was in Switzerland, um, 
with a so with a with a jazz tour, and it's you know it's a rich country and they pay very well um, in Switzerland, but then everything costs a lot of money too. So we were having lunch at this place uh, every day when we were rehearsing. It's you know really kind of cheap cafe, but we couldn't get anything for under twenty two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and I noticed also in German and Swiss German, they often put a lot of words together and make one word out of them. So uh, I just thought that'd be funny to say twenty two dollars for lunch. Right now, so so for the listeners who who that reference because the words twenty two fish a dollar fish lunch are all scrunched together as one word. So I was that was the other right. part. Why are they all scrunched? So you've answered you've answered that part. Well, yeah, it's, it's pretty much silliness and not knowing how to. No, that's that's awesome. There's always like these cool stories. Like I, I love the fact that there's a cafe and everything is 22 bucks or more, right? So that yeah, that's yeah. kind of neat. It's got it's got uh, it's got history to it. Um, right. So jazz. I mentioned those other things. How have the other genres of music? Like I mean, you go from from working with Betty and and your uncle. You're doing jazz, um, but there's all these other genres of music. How have how has that influenced your work, either as a writer or or as a producer? Uh Gosh, I don't know. Such a wide question because I think I grew up listening to just, you know, pop music and whatever was in front of me. Like sometimes it wouldn't be pop music. Like I got some like 30s big band music. My mom had a couple of records and I would just listen to whatever's in front of me. And when you're young, especially, you don't like, you don't, um, you don't really prejudice and this, right. this is that. And you don't classify things and everything's just music to you. You don't know. It's, it's, um, I guess I got into jazz because it was a it was a stretch for my ear. Like I figured out how to play stuff easily, like in pop rock music or whatever was on the radio. It, it's more simple kind of kind of chords and stuff like that. And when I heard jazz chords and rhythms that were intricate and you know they intrigued me and I wanted to figure them out. That's all. It was just about that. And so the deeper you get into that, I think the less popular <laughs> those music are. You know, jazz isn't a huge genre. You know, it's a, it's. It's not neat. so many it's, people. It's, it's, it. it's neat. It's there's a. I mean, there's some niche aspects to it, and and um, it's got its own vibe for sure, right? Like yeah. Um, but now, like those other genres, like the pop and things like that. Um, do you are you more into those because of the different artists you end up working with, or? Um, I think I just I never lost my love for the pop got it. pop music and 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 any music that has, has touched me somehow and that's what it's all about it's, it's some sort of you know it's supposed to um you know be full of emotion out of, out of the listener and so many things have done that to me over, over the years and i guess i've always um also i've learned that one of the guys i played with with my uncle growing up this guy's name is jack zaza he he's he's in his 90s now and he just retired a couple a couple of years ago really <laughs> And um, he plays a million instruments and, and came up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s playing on everybody's records in Canada, every different instrument. And he just always said, yeah, you keep learning the instruments, just learn whatever you can so that when the phone rings and, you know, someone has a job and whatever, you can do it. <laughs> so, so it's, you know. Uh, grow, grow grow your brand right like grow your brand like do, do whatever you can with it right yeah and it helps yeah. to like everything too like i said i like all those genres and i'm not a snob about one or the other i really love a simple pop song and complicated you know instrumental jazz composition and everything in between you know that's that's the kind of the way i grew up too i mean like i you know i love rock and roll i love metal i love jazz i I'll, I'll listen to it all, you know, like I, growing up, like you, you, it's, it's interesting because we talk about our, the influences and our, you know, what our parents listen to and, and we don't have a choice, right? We just kind of start listening to whatever they're listening to. And from there we, right. we build some sort of foundation, you know, like I remember driving around to St. Marie with my dad and his old Ford truck and, and we're listening to Johnny Cash and, and yeah. that's some of my earliest, you know, musical memories. And, but I hang out with my brother and, and it'd be Billy Joel. <laughs> so right, right? Yeah. or and and so on you know lionel richie and it just kind of started to evolve into all these other things but um yeah so so you're you're doing jazz you got all these genres um you know but but then there's another aspect to all this how do you go about writing jingles for companies like coca-cola or tv stations like how does do you is that do you apply to that do they call you how does that work? yeah that again i didn't well i i didn't i haven't done much of that the, the ones that I have done is because I knew somebody who, you know, um, was doing some advertising campaign. They needed some, some music and they, they knew 
and I was friends with him, you know, like, you know, three or four people who gave me all that kind of stuff. Right. A lot of it, is, especially, was when the web was really being like the internet was like a big new thing, you know, in the late like mid mid nineties, maybe. And I did a bunch of that for website. It was just for just because I knew people really. I, that's a whole other land of, of music uh, making, and it's it's not anything that I've ever really pursued because it's more of a day job kind of a thing where you're on call a lot, you know, you're doing a jingle and, and they need a change and they need it for, you know, three o'clock. And, you know, oh. It's a different, it's a whole different vibe. Like when I hear jingles, I'm thinking commercials sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Stuff in, um, yeah, commercials, uh, or, or, um, music for internet ads or whatever it is now. Still, still kind of neat, man. Like I, it's, it's still kind of neat that, um, you know, I was wondered, you know, where do those things get uh, born, I guess, or, you know, I, yeah, I, they're, they're either hired out to do to, to um, compose something specifically for that commercial, or they or they license a piece that's already in existence. So you know, a lot of actually, actually, a lot of singer songwriters and bands, their songs get placed on a commercial. They get licensed to a commercial, and that's the big break or whatever. That's how Vice yeah. got started with the Apple iPhone commercial. Uh, or is, iPod, I think it was. Is it like can you can you set out and say, well, is that a career? Like, can somebody say, well, I'm I'm going to have a career where I write jingles? Like, can you actually make a living at that? Yeah, absolutely. If you work for one of these places that that do that, or you do it yourself, but you're always you're just always doing that and always right. um, uh, submitting to those opportunities that come up, or or, or just getting hired directly to do it for sure. There's lots of people who do. do well, that's that kind of neat. It's kind of neat to know. Um, so I, I was listening to some of your tunes and we've been talking about your, your, your records in the past and stuff. And there was one that caught my ear and it was, uh, it was better place and it was off the $22 fish lunch, um, um, album, which is available yeah. on Apple music, Spotify and other platforms. I've, I've checked all that out. Um, if you search uh, Mark Zubeck, but if I may ask what, like there was some lyrics in there, where, where is that better place? And, you know, the, the lyric that you, that you kind of go down is, um, you know, what made you one step closer, I suppose is, is the question. And can we all get to that better place, Mark? What is it? Oh God. I don't know. That's the, that's the it's deep. It's deep. That's, right. It's the meaning of life. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, what is it about that? Um, well, you were you were so. Just a, a side question here before you go. So you said you were in Switzerland. Did you write that in Switzerland? And and you know, was it in reference to something there, maybe or or? Uh, no, it's just really in, in reference to kind of just picking yourself up off the ground once you know, and and don't let failure kind of stop you, and and kind of a self improvement thing and how to get to the next step all the time. Always trying to grow, and you know, um, yeah, yeah, one step closer, the better place. Um, it's about some, you know, spiritual thing that, you know, when I get off the path, help me find a way, kind of meditation. I'm not really a religious person, but it's just, you know, one of these kind of spiritual kind of things when we don't know where to turn and, and maybe it'll help, you know? Yeah. Uh, hey, any, any inspiration? And I was just, I picked up on it, I guess. Maybe it's just sort of pandemic thought, right? Like I, it, mm -hmm. we're, we're looking for a better place. And I thought, Hey, you know, that, so for whatever reason, I paid uh, some closer attention to that and I kind of yeah. kind of honed in on that, but I, you know, it makes sense, right? Pick yourself up off the ground and, and, you know, we're all looking for spirituality and self-improvement in some, some capacity and, and whatever capacity yeah. that is, it fits, right? So. Yeah. That's it. It's been a rough year, <laughs> you know, so yeah. I'm, I'm glad to be like kind of yeah. coming out of that pandemic wise and. You know, it's summer too, and things are um, just seem to be rolling again, kind of thing. So, so um, you you mentioned Switzerland. You've you've lived outside of Canada. You spent some time in in U.S. cities like New York. We we know that. Um, yeah. But at some point, you decided to come back to Canada, um, right. and you decided, hey, I'm going to focus on helping other Canadian talent. What what would you tell aspiring artists when it comes to Canada or the USA or going abroad career wise? What you know, is there a right path? Uh, what is the right path? What what makes sense? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I didn't set out for to have a path. I know I wanted to go to Berkeley, which was in Boston, and um, after that, like I didn't, I don't know what I wanted to do necessarily. So I can't speak to like the like setting out a path intentionally. So let me let me let me reframe it a little bit. Um, do we need to leave Canada? 
to right. to make it like like I I get it. Hey, Berkeley sounds amazing, of course, right? And and going to get life experiences in Switzerland and doing like as you go abroad. But do you need to leave Canada to make it as an artist? Yeah, not no. I mean, less and less and less these days, for sure, because of so much that's going on, you know, remotely and online, and and um, you know, you can get in front of as many people as anyone else can in any other city. Um, I, yeah, I went. To go, I, I ended up going to that school, and it was a really great networking opportunity. Is what it was, you know. Like, like you know, you can learn your scales and you can learn your rhythms and whatever else anywhere, really. But you go somewhere like that because of the opportunity. You know, you're going to be there with three thousand people who are like minded or whatever, and from all over the world, and you know, they're all at you know, decent level or whatever. Um. So. Uh, you know, I ended up going to New York because that's the place to be to make jazz music. But I was, <laughs> but I was also producing like mainstream music a little bit too. Um, so I don't know. It was more like wherever the wind <laughs> blew. That was like that was what made my decision. Just what made sense at the time. And would follow what made sense at the time. Well, you've, um, you've you've said something interesting here, and I just want to. I'm just picking up on it. Um, you know. Um, Music in terms of learning it, like if, if you if it's in you and you've got the ability to to learn and the skill and, and and get the skill and the talent. I think you said, hey, you know, you can pretty much learn those basics wherever, yeah. right? But you you said you know about about the school of Berkeley networking opportunities, and then I'm just thinking back when we first started talking. You said, you know, you know, my uncle, and I had a relationship with my uncle, and and then you know, there's the professor Pierce, and then you had a, a relationship with him, and yeah. and how much like. You know, I'm picking up more on the fact that um, it's it's how you treat people or how you work with people and the relationships that you build. And and I mean, the music is obviously the the product. Yeah. Um, but the you, relationship. You want to be fun to be around too, and not right? Want to be easy going. And, you know, but it, it seems like the relationship is is the key here, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so that's the, that's why you, you that's why you end up in a music city. You know, if you want to. That's one of the main reasons you'd want to do that, just to be in that atmosphere. And, and, and on the other hand, I'm not all that good at that. You know, I'm I'm kind of shy and quiet. But when it's about music, then like I got that's all I know about. It's like, you know, so <laughs> I can talk about that, and I can, you know, so. But yeah, it is all about relationships. That's what life is all about, and, and that's how I guess that's how I'm comfortable the most comfortable that's what makes sense to me those relationships the musical relationships right. make sense and, and uh, sometimes life doesn't always make sense uh, but but it, a song does and, and i don't know i guess that's why i'm so attracted to it anyway yeah. that's a little off topic from what you're asking me no no i you know what i i it, it makes sense and and um i i like exploring that because i think that you know one of the things when when folks listen to this is if they're exploring you know, their, their choices and, and their opportunities. And I think it's important. Like you said, Hey, you know, sometimes I'm shy, but when it, when it comes to music, you know, I, I, I change or, or, you know, it changes me or, you know, you interact in a different way. Um, yeah. I think it's important when people hear that they may be feeling the same way and, and, mm. and maybe it helps them sort of um, take a, a different look at how, um, how they might approach it, you know? For sure. So just in the matter of population, there's 10 times the amount of people in the United States. So you go to a city like New York and there's just people everywhere and you're, you're you know, you're, you're, you're in it, you know, so. Um, so, hey, maybe even that. So do you, do you kind of get lost, lost in the crowd on purpose in New York or, or, or just by opportunity? And, and maybe that's okay as you're kind of working through things? Um, yeah, I guess so. And then like, you know, you're asking me what, you know, what ended up, you know, coming back to Canada and this and that, and and some some of it's about that. Like, you you can like yeah, for sure. There's a lot of other guys like me in New York making mainstream music, right? Um, and uh, here in Toronto, there's not so much. We just have a way smaller population, whatever. Um, so, you know, I I decided to come back. Um, I don't know. A relationship had ended, and and. There was an opportunity to do some a little work here, but then I, I realized that one of the big reasons to stay was the, the, the government funding we have for the arts here, and uh, organizations that help out musicians and help out artists, you know, pay for stuff, release stuff, uh, market their stuff, all of that. 
So, you know, like Factor, the Ontario Arts Council and Canada Council for the Arts, um, Toronto Arts Council. So that stuff kind of doesn't exist in, in the States. There's a few private kind of foundation things, but for the most part, it doesn't exist. So that's a big help here for, for artists who are, you know, um, trying to fund their own stuff. So there's there's, uh, there's help available in grant funding. So. Well, that's good to know. So if anybody's listening, so Canada seems to, uh, what I'm hearing is Canada has a bit of a better um, support or, or they support that the arts a little bit more in, in your experiences than yeah. in the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we get uh, grants for recording albums, EPs for making music videos. For, uh, and the big bands, you, you're big Canadian bands like, you know, rock bands like metric or something i've seen them always getting getting in stuff so everybody taps into it because there's it's available <laughs> yeah and we need it here because we're a tenth the population so right we're a boost of time, right? so you come back to canada and you started up zed records z-e-d-d zed records oh, yeah. Yeah. um but what's what is zed where does zed come from what is yeah i mean I'm, <laughs> is it I'm, almost, I'm gonna ask is it uh, is it uncle zed like i don't even know uncle's name yet like we use that no, uncle. No, his <laughs> name is kahoot my dad's name is, and that's my mom's brother so uh, <laughs> yeah Zub, my name is zubek people would call me z people would call me zed it's ah, names or whatever play on the name and um and i incorporated <laughs> this thing right around I, and i did a search <laughs> i was like is there anyone else named zed and oh there's this up-and-coming dj um in germany who's yeah he doesn't it looks like a real small time thing, though. So I went ahead and <laughs> incorporated my name and everything. And next thing you know, Zed is a huge thing. So, yeah, everyone emails us thinking that we're uh, Zed, the German DJ. Well, you know, Zed, to me, Zed, the, the only Zed I knew before you was, um, I used to I used to work out at a gym, and there was this guy, big muscle guy, and his nickname was Zed. So, like, Oh, wow. That, yeah. Well, it's on Pulp Fiction, isn't it? Zed's dead or whatever. Right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, those are the closest references, right? So, mm-hmm. so listen. I remember a few years ago, uh, certainly before the pandemic, before we were we weren't allowed to go anywhere. Um, yeah. You did you you were doing them some sort of annual thing where you'd say, hey, if if if, uh, if we're registered with you, you'd send out an email and say, hey, you want to get together? Let's meet downtown. You, you'd put something together. Yeah. Um, what was that all about? And are you are you going to revisit it? Yeah, totally. I missed that. Um, yeah, I've done it. Uh... Yeah, every year for several, and, and uh, yeah, just a way to get together at a at a, at a venue and kind of at this whole space and um, get together and, and uh, chat, sing songs, maybe people bring guitars, people sing a song. It's pretty impromptu, and just to um, cause sometimes like I, I also I, it's good to meet, uh, put a face to the name type of thing. Maybe right. that's emails back and forth and never met or whatever. It's a great opportunity for everyone to meet. That's it. So you're you're back to sort of the the relationship part of, again, eh? Like you know, meeting people, mingling, getting to know people, and yeah, I guess so. As a way, honestly, it's a way to force myself to do it too, because I'm not the type <laughs> who goes to, goes to the party and talks to everybody, you know. So it's a you know, it's a, if I'm at an event that's that specific, then, then. so let me ask and you, it, let me ask you, Mark, um, between between the you know being in Canada or the United States and having worked with different artists and etc. Did you find a difference in how artists support each other between between um, you know countries or anything like that, or is it, it do, uh, do do artists support artists and, and that sort of thing in in the U.S. as much as they do in Canada or vice versa? Or I don't think that's a that's a um, geographical thing. It's, uh, I think that you know most people think that's the right thing to do and, yeah. and to to kind of work together and. As far as because what when you talk about that it makes me think of like uh, competition and yes. people don't, who don't want to be supportive of yeah. each other because they want the star they want to be the star of the show and, and or whatever it is. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's nice people and there's mean people everywhere <laughs> everywhere in the world. I don't know if it matters. So well, much. I just I was thinking, you know, given the the larger population in in um, in the U.S. And, and some of the cities you were in, if if maybe it took on a bit of a different uh, feel or a tone to it or whatever. Uh, in no, you know, it's um, it's just uh, New York is a pretty extreme place, so you'd see extremes, but it's the same. Like, it'd same. Be, you know, you'd, you'd see some really nice New Yorkers and some real like mean New Yorkers and, and everything in between. And, and but uh, yeah. Pe- um, it's nice to see when when that networking 
uh, supporting each other kind of thing happens because it helps everybody and just creates positivity it creates and it's just a win-win for everybody and, you know i don't see that's why you wouldn't want to that's good that. to know it's good to know um so he so zed records just you you have a website www.zedrecords double d z z e d t records.com right. um that's focused on end-to-end music production for artists um yeah. tell me a little bit about the process uh, of how that works um, what what do you do to help someone who comes in and says, "Hey, I want to record a song." So if Guido walks in and says, "Hey, Mark, uh, I have this yeah. idea. I want to record a song. I've never done this before." What yeah. what does that records do? Well, I mean, I'll kind of meet you where you're at and see. You know, I mean, the requirement is that you have a great voice and you can really sing. <laughs> um, but you know, that's about it. You don't have to have really songwriting experience if you want to do original music that you can write together so you know i work with a singer who is wherever they're at in their songwriting level uh and i'll meet them where they're at and we you know we'll either write a song from scratch or i'll take a song that they've that they've written or half written and kind of help them tweak it or i'll just meet them where they're at and, and uh, um in my case i'm doing all the, the instrumentation i'm like uh, playing all the instruments programming Oh. All that kind of stuff, and they're singers. And then, you know, I, I take it to a finished master, right? production, so, vocal production, mixing, mastering. So if I come in and I say, "Hey, I got this song. I wrote, I wrote half of a song, and I got this idea." You look at it. You say, "You know what? Yeah, you listen to me. I, I, I can, I can sing." From an instrumentation perspective, you help, you help deliver some, of, some of the instruments, some of the sound. Is that mm-hmm. what I'm hearing? Cool. Yeah, all, all of the sound for the most part, unless it's something I can't play. So if I need like a horn section, then I'll, I'll hire some people to play the horns. But like I play the bass and guitar and drums and keyboard. Oh, wow, that's that's pretty and amazing. I got, I got a piano and uh, upright bass. And just, uh, uh, yeah, so string sections, horn sections, I'd have to hire that, but it is a mostly play. But if I now, if I could play guitar, I could play guitar and, and sing that, yeah. that's still, that's I could still do that, right? Oh, that's yeah, yeah, meet you where you're at, that's part of your thing, and then I'll, I'll fill in the blanks of whatever. whatever sounds you like you got so, a sounds like you got a full studio of stuff going on there, so yeah, and it's kind of, I guess it's sort of that whole shy thing that I never wanted to be the front person that's singer. So right. I kind of learned just to do everything else. <laughs> so if, yeah. if uh, so I meet the singer where they're at, I like being that behind the scenes person. That's what's attractive about it, I think. Now to get things going, I, I also noticed on your, on your Zed Records uh, website that you offer a free download called the Indie Artist Guide to a Successful Music Career. Right. Um, what, what are some of the key themes in that download? Like if I download that thing, um, how does it help me if I'm an aspiring musical artist? Like, what, what, what do you? What are some of the things that you say? Hey, you know, without without reading the th- the the guide to right. us, what am I going to get? Out of this? Well, I I I guess kind of gets you thinking about all the different pieces of the puzzle to 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 being a successful artist, and you know, it starts like I say, I, I meet someone as long as they have a great voice. But, you know, that's not all it takes to be a successful artist, obviously. Right. You can have a great voice. If you come over, we can make a great song. I mean, it sounds like it could be on the radio, you know, but then what? You know, what are you going to do? So, you know, it's, it's a lot of um, just stuff to, to ask about if, you're, if your song is, is kind of up to par. And then if you're, um, you know, if your marketing is up to par, if your social is and your networking is up to par. And uh, it's just a kind of a checklist of the kind of stuff you want to start thinking about if you want to um, get in front of a lot of people and, and, and get, get lose it in front of a lot of people. So it gets me th- it gets me thinking about um, some of the things, some of the components that I might need in, in the conversation that we might have um, uh, moving forward, I guess it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's, it's really nice. And you put the guide together yourself? Yeah, I had help um, with uh, a marketing person to kind of put it all together and write it. Cohesively, come on, man! You went to Berkeley. What do you mean cohesively? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, people, well, people the same stuff all the time, and I end up, you know, answering these questions like, so many times like that. So, <laughs> just put it all in one place. <laughs> hey, listen, Mark. This has been uh, a really cool opportunity to explore, um, you know, the world of, of producing music with you, and and you are a pretty amazing talent. Your music's awesome. Um, I am, I'm really happy that you decided to leverage your talent here in Canada. Um, you know, I'm a big uh, promoter when it comes to continuing to grow our product. Um, right. is there anything you'd like to share with the audience of, you know, as we're bringing this, uh, this 
this the conclusion in home? I've I've gone into my my passion and and just my obsession or whatever it was. Like I was like two years old. Like this is all I ever kind of knew and what I wanted to do. But it always it, it didn't it didn't always pay off, you know. And what ends up happening is, um, people are sick of put it this way. I didn't <laughs> I didn't make a great living until I was in my thirties. Right. And um, you know I was I had a lot of great credits before that, but I didn't make a whole lot of money especially living in New York. It's such an expensive place to live. So, but I stuck to it. I didn't quit partially because I don't know how to do anything else. And I'm not interested in doing anything else, but, um, <laughs> but you know, a lot of people around you will quit one by one. Think of that. And you end up being <laughs> almost the last guy standing something. So one of my phrases I always tell people is be too stupid to quit. <laughs> just be too stupid to quit because it did pay off and you know now I'm in my 40s and I, and I can support my kids and and um and and, and I, I don't regret any, any of it you know so uh I guess that's advice uh, advice to live by and I like that be too stupid to quit I yeah. I've, I've I've written that <laughs> one down and it's gonna go in my in my book of of quotes right um <laughs> Well, there you have it, folks. It's Mark Zubek, music producer, artist, courtesy of his uh, production company, Zed Records. That's www.zedrecords.com. Follow him on Twitter, at Zed Records. Also on Facebook, at Zed Records. All the links will be available in the podcast notes. If you're an aspiring musical talent, check out Mark. Tell him that you listened to his awesome interview here on the Go On The Beatle podcast. Thank you, Mark. We hope to have you back in the future. Hey, thank you so much, people. It's a pleasure. Check it out, folks. Zed Records, made in Canada. And now a special treat from Mark Zubak and Zed Records. We're going to listen to uh, a song that's uh, recently uh, been debuted uh, by artist Tanya Tusa. And you're going to love these vocals. The song is called Get Down To It. And the premise of the song is really about being uh, where you want to be um, in a relationship. Um, So thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, Tanya. Let's get down to it. Thanks, how are you? Feels like you'll never come through. Been waiting forever. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't want to lose this if I were you. So I think that you better do something to consider. Wow, what a great song. So catchy, fantastic vocals. 
Uh, that's Tanya Tusa with Get Down To It. Thank you, Mark Zubek and Zed Records, for introducing us to that and providing uh, the song to us today. Thank you, Tanya Tusa, for creating the song and sharing it with us here on the Go On With Guido podcast. Folks, if you're interested in picking the song up for yourself, I will include the smart links in the podcast notes to your favorite platforms like Apple Music and Spotify. There's a few other options as well. Check it out. That's Tanya Tusa with Get Down To It. All right, and now before we get to our next segment, uh, a couple of words from our Promote Canada sponsors. Hi, I'm Richard Chase, introducing Chaser's Fresh Juice, a local business in Toronto. We've been in business for over 20 years, initially supporting our local Toronto area and now servicing all of Canada. Chaser's provides fresh organic juices, ingredients, including citrus zests, dehydrated garnishes, and fresh citrus peels to enhance any cocktail or recipe you can think of. We have successfully supplied restaurants, distilleries, crop breweries, and bakeries across the country. Reach out to orders at chasersjuice.com for any questions you may have. We are a customized fresh juice company, and I'm sure we can help you. Thank you. Recipes at My Table is a work of family, love of food, and sharing of stories. The stories keep the memories alive and make every day a party in my kitchen. Join me for the sharing of traditional Italian recipes and so much more. Visit me at www.recipesatmytable.com. I'd like to welcome back to the podcast, Kathy Nesbitt. Kathy, multi-award-winning environmental innovator working to motivate people towards living a more sustainable life, has been here on a podcast episode educating us on composting. And if you haven't heard that, I encourage you to check that out. But today, today she's here to share with us another one of her talents and ventures, and that is laughing. Ha <laughs> ha! You heard me right. She's going to talk to us about how and why we should laugh. Welcome back to the show, Kathy. I am inspired by your portfolio of multiple talents. How are you today? Thank you, Guido. That's, that's a great introduction. I am doing great, and I'm excited to be back to talk about my latest initiative. This, this is fun. I, when, we, when we talked about this, I was like, I was so excited. I was like, this is going to be fun. What happened was, folks, at the end of our last chat, at the end of, of our last podcast segment that we did together, we went off the air, so to speak, because I only do this monthly. But you and I talked a little bit longer and you told me about your laughing classes. And of course, I laughed and I said, you're what? And you said, Guido, I do laughter yoga. Kathy, what is laughter yoga? <laughs> so laughter yoga is, it's not about fancy pants or poses. It's intentional <laughs> laughter exercises, just deciding to laugh. Um, laughter is the best medicine. We've all heard it before. And so it's just deciding. So it really is um, a series of, you know, deep diaphragmatic breathing, gentle movement, and laughing, just playful fun. So I'm focusing on laughing. Exactly. Just deciding to laugh. It's not about jokes or comedy. It's, um, yeah, little games to inspire the laughter. So as the leader, you lead through um, some games. And, um, yeah, it's it's... Self-care 101. It's a beautiful thing. I, we're going to learn more about this. So <laughs> I understand that you're a what's considered a laughter ambassador. Now, how did you exactly come upon being that in terms of what events led you to the discovery of laughter being therapeutic? And you've already sort of mentioned a couple of areas where that might be the case. But what led you to that? How did How did you discover this? Thank you. So laughter yoga was uh, created in 1995 by a medical doctor, Dr. Madan Kateria. And, you know, he was kind of dispensing drugs and whatever. And <laughs> and then uh, was writing an article about laughter for a magazine. And as he was researching, he kept on coming across all this research that proved that laughter was the best medicine. So he thought, wow, if laughter is the best medicine, why don't we just laugh? Um, so it kind of started then. Now it's a global movement, laughter clubs around the world. And I came to it at a time when I was kind of getting discouraged with my worm uh, mission. 
you know, it was, I was about 10 years in and <laughs> I have a lot of energy, but I was getting discouraged with, you know, people not understanding why they needed to have worms. And folks, if you haven't listened to that episode, please do. <laughs> <laughs> right. When we, when, right. It's important to say when, when Kathy's talking about worms, we're talking about composting worms. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, <laughs> exactly. Right. Not so, Tabor, so, nothing else. So, okay. So, yeah, so Dr. Kateria um, recognizes certain people. So this is a global movement, and his goal is world peace. And, to, you know, with anything, when you encourage people to participate in your mission, they want to help you out. And so I think early on, Madan recognized that I was one of those natural laughers. I loved laughter yoga, and... Um, I was honored um, in 2017 to be recognized as a laughter ambassador. And I, I really wear that title with great pride and and I demonstrate laughter yoga. I think I'm a great ambassador because every time I'm out in the public, I'm talking about laughter yoga. This is great. So uh, now when I said laughter ambassador, this is an actual designation that you got from the doctor. Uh, yes. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I was thinking, well, you, you're an ambassador of laughter, right? As a laughter. But this is an actual designation. That, now, that's, uh, that's congratulations. <laughs> you know, as as, yeah, I, as yeah, I'm thinking right? through that. Know. Wow. Yes. Okay. So, awesome. So, now, during our chat, Kathy, you also, um, and this is really interesting. I, I, let me ask. You said to me that you have built ab muscles just from laughing and I need to know, is, is that really true? And are, if that's true, are, is that the only muscle, are abs the only muscle that we could build from laughing? And, and how does that even happen? How do, you build, how do you build those muscles through laughter? Are we on a, a new discovery here in terms of physical and, and, and mental health, perhaps? I love that question. I, you know, I was like, yes, it is a new physical, mental um, combination. Laughter is a cardiovascular workout. You know, have you, you know, anyone that's listening, if you've ever had one of those great belly laughs with your friends or family and you're just like, you can't stop laughing more yeah. as kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And your stomach's hurting, your cheeks are hurting, you're crying and you're laughing so hard. Mm. Right. Um, yes. It's a cardiovascular workout. So you're, you're for sure rock. Hard. I have rock hard abs. Yes. From laughing. <laughs> Because we're doing deep diaphragmatic laughing, mm -hmm. like ha, 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 you have to breathe in. So you breathe in, which then moves your diaphragm. So your diaphragm is moving all of your inter internal organs. So it builds your heart. It builds lung capacity. It makes your fate like your skin looks better. I mean, it's just uh, an overall full body workout. Now, that's incredible. So how from the physical side of it, um, there's those, those muscle benefits and it, and it from the from the from the brain side of it, you're you're working out your your mental health as well, um, because you're obviously happier as you're laughing, right? And it's contagious. Exactly. So versus so here's what happens when we're laughing, we're secreting all the love drugs. Like I say, have you had your daily dose? Right. Dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. Mm. Versus when we're stressed, we're secreting cortisol. Makes sense. It's our choice it and we sense. can't, here's another thing, you know, for, for mental health and physical health, we cannot heal when we're in stress mode. Just like, I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, Hey, you, you pull a muscle, you break a bone. There's a certain regimen you have to follow to heal. And, and similar to this, right? You're following a regimen. Kathy, how often, like, so when, you know, when I talk to the doctor, he says, well, you got to three times a week, you know, half hour, you should run or, or work up a sweat. How, what's the what's the frequency and, and duration as far as laughter goes? If people can add laughter to their daily life, 10 to 15 minutes of sustained belly laughter is equivalent to about 300 sit-ups, um, 30 minutes on a rowing machine. I mean, I could give you all Wait kinds of equivalents. If I laugh for 10 to 15 minutes a day, that's the equivalent yeah. of 300 sit-ups? Yes. Wow. Yes. And, you know, you can't, you know, you, it's fine to watch a comedy or whatever, but laughter yoga is not about jokes or comedy. And even if you go to a comedy club, you can't be laughing right. full on. You can't be doing your laughter yoga because they'll kick you out of the club. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't even, I, right now, I don't think they let me into the club the way things are going. But uh, so 10 to 15 minutes daily of laughter. Um, okay. So uh, as a as a laugh ambassador, um, and and you've you've said it a couple of times. This isn't just you're not telling jokes. You, you, there's a there's a process that you take people through. You actually have classes to teach people how to laugh, and and do the laughter yoga. And you have been recognized by multiple community groups, by agencies, by people alike. And and I've I've seen it. I've read it. It's online. They've thanked you for the work that you've done in this space. Can you tell us a little bit about your classes, how those work? Are they, I mean, there must be a virtual one nowadays, the way things have been going with the, the pandemic. And how long are they? Is it part of a larger program? Is it a, you know, is it a customized program? Sorry for all the questions. I'm just curious. Can, can you know, like, can somebody even try a session out if they're interested? Absolutely. Great question. So, yeah, so there are a few options. Um, every Tuesday I offer laughter yoga free, so anyone can come and check it out. 30 minutes of free self-care wow. laughter on Zoom, so that's online. Um, yes, I do encourage people to come and check it out for sure. And there are tons of um, classes online too. Now, I, I'm also a laughter yoga teacher, so I can teach people to lead the laughter, and that's a two-day course. Um, In-person is great. We're also doing it online now, so um, either way, whatever people can come from around the world, which is a beautiful thing. And yeah, it's you know, imagine two days of laughter, and the, the, the nice part about becoming a laughter leader is yes, you can make a little bit, bit of money, you know, we're, you know, getting hired to do laughter f f in right. various places, but I really want to encourage people to take the laughter leader training, the two day training so that they can learn about laughter so that they, you know, once you learn something and you practice it and, be, and it becomes you, then you can teach it. Then you can really know, like, so Dave Berman, a wonderful laughter yoga um, teacher, he says, no laughter, no problem. No laughter, no problem. And let me explain. Uh -huh. English is a beautiful language. Yeah. So no laughter, K-N-O-W, oh. laughter, ah. <laughs> and no problem. You got me. <laughs> and no, pro and yeah. no laughter, yeah. K-N-O-W, problem, right? You better have your therapist on, or you got to talk about your problem if you're not laughing. Right. Laughter helps us deal with life better and we're not laughing at the situation we're laughing because of the situation and here's what i'm going to give you an example so our brain requires 25 percent more oxygen than the rest of our body as an operating principle huh? have you ever lost your keys and you're flapping around you're like i gotta go where are my <laughs> keys yeah right the, the longer you're flapping around you're never finding your keys in that state your brain is literally being deprived of oxygen hmm. So you need to stop flapping around, <laughs> take a deep breath, you know, apologize to everyone, and then your brain gets <laughs> oxygenated, you'll find your keys, phone, glasses, whatever right. you've lost. Chain, you, you turn away from the panic, right? You turn away from the panic. Um, you, less, you, you tamp out the stress, right? Yeah. You, you, you embrace the joy in the moment rather than getting in fight or flight mode. You, you get into freedom. So really, really key information there as you're as you're walking us through it. It's it's cool. So every Tuesday you do 30 minutes on Zoom, and that's free to anybody who wants to try it out. Um, but you're also recommending um, the the training course, the two day training course. If and that teaches people how to be laughter yoga teachers. Is that correct? Did I get that right? How how, how to how to be leaders. How to be leaders. How to be leaders. Yeah, Thank so you. you. So you, now, after the two day training, you become a leader. And if you want to be a laughter yoga teacher, then you become, it's a five day training. Wow. Okay. Sorry, I'm writing these down because this is kind of neat. And actually very neat. Now, a quick question, and I know things have been a little different out of my own curiosity here with the pandemic, but um, have you done this with schools or, or um, like business offices or, or things like that, where you go in and sort of do, do uh, laughter uh, yoga with uh, folks? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. So for corporate, it's so beautiful for team building, right? Reduces absenteeism, increases productivity. People like each other. You know, you can communicate better because you're, you, it really breaks down those barriers, those, that angst, that kind of, that energy that comes. 
that precedes us. Are people mm-hmm. reluctant? Are when you do that, Kathy? I got to know. Are people? Do they do they seem a little bit reluctant or shy, like between the corporate or the schools or anything like that? Like, do you get a do you get some folks that kind of go, ah, no, I'm not going to do this, <laughs> or is everybody kind of like, all right, let me try this out, you know? Ah, uh, depends on the audience. Yeah, um, I I was hired by um, by Girls Inc. Uh, to do a gig with with teen girls, and they were really hard. I was like, oh, I'm laughing, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then I was like, oh. Oh, they, you know, when you're a teenager, you already look ridiculous. You right. think you do, and you're already trying to fit in, and you you feel awkward already. You want to laugh? You want me to laugh for nothing? So then <laughs> I was like, what am I going to do? So then I put music on, uh, and we started dancing, and it changed everything. So the, I just needed to get out of my head and, and go, okay, what do I need to do here? The the connection point. So this is totally intriguing. Um, I I have a. I'm just curious. Would you be willing to do um, a, like a small example today? Like, would you be able to, if I, if, if, and I know this is probably hard and you don't believe that it's going to happen, but if I just stop talking for a few minutes and just let you talk, would you be willing to walk the listeners through uh, like a, a small sort of sample of, of, of what they could do when it comes to sort of laughter yoga? Can you be quiet for a few minutes? I'm gonna, I don't know. I'm going to try. <laughs> it's really hard. When I you're... absolutely can. Thank you, Guida. That's awesome. Okay. I'm sorry. That was rude. <laughs> no, no. You listen, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a podcast here. I'm talking all the time, right? They, they, here at home, they say, like, do you ever stop? I don't know if I can stop, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try first. <laughs> I'm chatty Kathy. I get it. <laughs> okay. So laughter yoga, a laughter yoga session is anywhere, you know, half an hour to an hour. My sessions are half an hour. And it in, involves deep diaphragmatic breathing. As soon as so, what we do is we start with some warm up exercises and we and it's clapping and chanting. So we clap and it's a rhythm. So it's one, two, one, two, three. And if anyone's listening, play along. I want you to be smiling. And there's words. So you say instead of one, two, you say ho, ho, ha, 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 smiling. Ho, ho, ha, 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 ho, ho, ha, 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 ho, ho, ha, 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 ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. And between exercises, we would say very good, very good, yay. And we're throwing throwing my hands up in a V shape, like yippee, ha, ha, ha. And so this kind of gets us into our body. Then we would do some deep breathing. So we'd breathe in raise our arms up smiling holding our breath for a little bit longer and then we exhale ha and if you make an an exhale with a a sigh it really does get send a message to your brain that you're happy it sends that added message um so when you're when you when we're doing the the laughter exercises there's little games so once we've done our ho ho and ha ha ha, and we've warmed up a little bit, done some gentle movements, some stretches, then we would do like some games. So one of the games is milkshake laughter. So holding up two vessels like we're gonna make a milkshake, and then you mix them together, youp, and they're back, youp, and you mix again, youp, and then you drink it, ha 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 ha. Or you do say no money laughter. You pull your pockets out and you look. You're like, oh, no money, ha, 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 ha. Or cell phone laughter, you pull out your cell phone, pretend. You just your hand, and you're like pretending somebody's telling you a funny story, and you're laughing, ha, 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 And as soon as you start laughing, it's contagious. In the Zoom room, it's a beautiful thing because everyone can see everyone. You know, we're like Hollywood Squares, and everyone's seeing everybody. I do encourage people to have their camera on when we're online. It's, it, you know, it makes it better for connection. Um, yeah, so online is really working out great. Um, in person is a really wonderful way because you feel the energy. I just did my first in person with a wonderful um, special needs group called um, the Fan Club. It's full access network, and we it's our third month. Every Friday, Guido, we meet. And we, I, this was online, and then this one, um, we were able to meet in person, and it was so much more engaging and fun. Like, you know, I could just see everybody's energy. I could go over to them and, you know, help them to participate. Kathy, that was cool. I, I, I managed to not speak while you were doing those samples, but I almost, <laughs> you almost had me laughing out loud. So <laughs> that was, <laughs> that's, that's where I had to hold back a little bit. So. Um, those are awesome. They're, those are awesome. And now you, you also, 
you do some videos, right? Where you like, so I'm, I'm myself and the listeners, we're visualizing what you're talking about, but you, I think you have some videos online somewhere, right? Like on your site or on yes, some of the on social my media page, there's, um, what are they called? Fab fun Friday, um, shorts. And they're most of them, well, they're under five minutes, right? Most of them are under three minutes. Right. That's what they're called. Fab, fab Fridays. And, and then you have some, some clips there that folks can actually visualize, see what you described to us in, in those samples as well. Mm. Um, and that's on Kathy's club, Kathy's club.com. That's Kathy's club.com with a C. So you can check out the videos that sort of accompany, um, the, uh, the audio description that you gave us. And that was really cool. That was really cool. Um, Kathy, you are, uh, I mean, you are equally interesting as you are talented. I, I said that to you when we when we sort of concluded our last conversation. You have all these sort of diverse things that, that you've got going on. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for sharing this talent with us. Um, is there anything that you'd like to leave us with today? I, I would just like to encourage everybody to think about adding laughter to their life. And if not laughter, if that's a little bit of a stretch just smiling if you just like mm -hmm. grin walk around grinning for two minutes just to see how it feels it will change your state you'll feel different i'm i've smiled this whole time we've been talking so thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> there you have it folks kathy nesbitt laughter ambassador and laughter yoga instructor giving us an alternate option for physical and mental health you can check out her website at www.kathysclub.com and kathy's with a c you can call her at 905-775-9495 or toll free at 1-888-775-9495. You can check out her videos online. And um, I'm going to have all this information available in the podcast notes with links. Thank you again, uh, Kathy, for being here. And we'll talk again real soon, right? Thank you, Guido. <laughs> So we are truly blessed here on the Go On With uh, Guido podcast show when it comes to uh, musical talent. And I've got a, a, a group here called The Mystic Fools. And it's a band that was started by a gentleman named uh, Jeff Lipka. Um, now, Jeff Lipka is a Toronto-based composer, producer, and guitarist, versatile in a multitude of styles. Uh, Jeff started uh, music at the age of eight, uh, first with a short stint on ukulele, then a few years later on uh, organ. At about age 12, he started learning the violin. Around age 15, he found his life's calling uh, when he picked up an old nylon string guitar. And, and so began his obsession with the guitar and composing music of all types. He went on to study at Humber College um, and their renowned music program. After finishing college, Jeff started the band called Mystic Fools and recorded a full-length CD. The group went on to open for some of Canada's legendary bands, including Blue Rodeo, April Wine, and Kim Mitchell. Uh, Jeff has since gone on to perform with Billboard charting artists, as well as tour with different groups across Canada, United States, Caribbean, and Africa. He recently performed a sold-out uh, run at the Ed Mervish Theatre in the world premiere of the new musical Jukebox Hero, the musical, uh, based on the music of Foreigner and overseen by Mick Jones. As a recording artist, his guitar playing, bass playing, and singing can be heard on a wide range of commercial recordings as diverse as Latin, dance, pop, rock, rap, exercise, children music, as well as on TV stations, CTV, TSN, and international music libraries. A number of these recordings have gone on to become gold and platinum albums. Jeff is currently composing and producing music for several artists. So we are privileged here today uh, to get a couple of songs from uh, Mystic Fools. Um, but more so, uh, typically what happens is I have an opportunity to interview musical guests or other guests, and, and you hear about that here on the show. Um, but in this scenario... Um, Jeff and bandmate James Woods were having some conversations about the songs and introducing them, and, and uh, those conversations got recorded. So we're going to let Jeff and James introduce some of the material today. The first song that we're going to actually hear is Falling Off the Edge of the World. So let's listen in on Jeff and James introducing that for us. Hey there, I'm Jeff Lipka. Uh, I'm the main writer, guitar player, and sometimes um, background vocalist for the band Mystic Fools. And we're here today 
uh, to talk about Falling Off the Edge of the World, uh, the song Falling Off the Edge of the World, and our new song, Get Lit. James? Hi, I'm James Woods. I'm the uh, the uh, lead vocalist and many of the backup vocalists on, uh, uh, on both Falling yes, Off are. the Edge of the World and on Get Lit. Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about, about the song, buddy? <laughs> so for those of you playing along at home, this is uh this is like take three. Um usually by the time by the time the intro gets to be any longer than the song, that's when we stop and start over. And try again. again. So, so uh Jeff, tell me where we, tell me where Falling Off the Edge of the World came from. Do you want to talk about the music first or do you want to talk about the lyric? Uh, let's talk about the music first. So I, I remember I was fooling around with like a guitar practice pattern that I had come up with that went, I have my guitar in my hand. So it went something like this and a little bit of it sort of tweaked my interest. And I'm like, Oh, I got to write a kind of a lick like that. I wanted to do like a lick rock thing, which turned into Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, and I just kind of loved that. Knew I had to write a tune um, about it. And lyrically speaking, um, in my early twenties, I was uh, experimenting a little bit with natural psychedelic substances and just trying to figure out the world, as lots of people that age do then and still do now. And it, it just kind of felt like an appropriate lyric for things being turned upside down and. Uh, up being down and left being right. And I love the image of sort of musicians walking up to the edge of the world and falling into this big uh, pit of purple music. So that's kind of was the initial <laughs> vocal or vocal rather uh, lyrical idea. I'm so glad you never told me that. <laughs> me too. Because I would have I'm been making live fun this... of you for the last 25 years yeah. just on... I'm smarter just than on, I look. <laughs> just on that, just on the pit of purple music. I'm but but yeah, this song was. No, um, great. Well, James could take over a bit about the studio talk, but this song we we had hoped to record when we were recording the album uh, of the same name, but the song never got finished back in the day. Uh, but we liked the title, so we kept the album. That, but James will tell you a little more about that. Yeah, so the the uh, I don't I and mean, I I don't think we even ever managed to put down a bad track for this. Like with, like the way we had recorded the record, we had we had ten s- songs that we'd been playing in front of audiences for a couple of years, and uh, and they were pretty tight, and yeah. we were able to go in and do them live off the floor with the, you know, just by the, and large. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, all, all of, all of, all of the beds were pretty much live off the floor. And even some of the, some of the, vo- some of the scratch vocals, we actually, I think we actually yep. kept one of the, one of the vocal tracks. Yeah, um, for sure we did from that just because it felt like the band. Um, and yeah, and the, the record does feel it's, it's funny. I, I, I played, played part of the, uh, we have a we have a videotape of our CD release party, and I played it for uh, for my teenage daughter, and uh, and she was like, "It sounds like the record," and I'm like, "Well, yeah, <laughs> it's it's the same <laughs> it's the same band. It's just you're you know you're not hearing all the parts, but you're hearing everything that we could put into a live show." Um, and so the so the record, as much as there are like a ton of uh, multi tracks on it, lots of vocals, lots of guitars, uh, it still sounds like we did. Yeah. Um, and and I'll I'll always be proud of proud of that our our little our little corner of the uh, of the swamp rock grunge early nineties world, right? That's um, uh, that's. But, but yeah, this, I do. Go ahead, please. Jeff. No, but I do. <laughs> I do remember this song, uh, or, or rather, being in the studio and talking about doing this song. And I, I will never forget every time we'd go in the studio, week after week, pieces of gear seemed to go missing. And I, you know, I remember one day asking, and and the producer, or rather, uh, the engineers, the guys who owned the studio, were like, they didn't really want to tell us why things were going missing, you know, and. Uh, 
there was a phone or something that went missing and uh we knew we had to get that record done and we and we did we and just we didn't did. get the we just we never didn't got get the title track <laughs> never got the title track cut and the and so, the art and the artwork was already being produced so so that was that um yeah so you want to take it I mean, it ended up yeah. taking a good 20 years to finish the song, ironic. Well, maybe yeah, the, 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 the long and short is that like seven, about seven years after that, we actually, Jeff and I put put down the, uh, I guess Jeff had put down a drum track and guitar tracks. And, uh, yeah, and some bass. I can't remember if it was electric bass or, or keyboard bass, but yeah. And then, and uh, in his like first home studio setup, uh, I went in and did the vocals. And now... Jeff, do you remember, was it just, did we just do the lead, the lead vocal and, and the doubling on the lead vocal or did we do, when did we do all those, all those layered harmony tracks? Uh, it was many sessions and I, I feel like we did that over a period of maybe a few weeks, maybe a yeah. few months. I'm not really clearer I, it wasn't one session i remember doing all the leads in sort of one sitting maybe probably the probably what you said yeah and we came up with new parts and i i'm like oh we need a whole pile of vocals for for the chorus and you know and lots of different stuff so back james came and <laughs> yeah, trucking there was, into my place late at night was, and recording vocals and whatever there was stuff that i that when i heard the last mix um, before before falling off the edge of the world went you know went with the rest of the the album to go up on uh, on iTunes and Spotify and every place yeah. Bandcamp where they pay us more money go to Bandcamp yeah, um, please uh, when the first the first time I heard that that final mix I was I listened to the backing vocals I was like where did those come from what am I singing <laughs> <laughs> what are the words I message I message Jeff and go I remember what, that what the words are that I'm singing there and and it, it took me a while to. Uh, <laughs> took me a while to figure it out, but it, it, it was, it, it really, it's, it's a, it's a song that was like, like took forever to craft. Um, eventually it went from having to program drums to having, uh, our, our friend Dave Patel, who's like a killer, killer drummer. Um, World class. One, yeah, of the, he, one of the top ones in, he is in fan, Canada for he, sure. He is a fantastic drummer. Uh, uh, came in and recorded the drum part on that. And our original bass player, Mark Sinclair, uh, played uh, bass on it as well. So it, it's kind of, it, it it's it's weird. It's more or less the band. It's more or less the band, but so long, but like over a stretch of many many years, many many recording sessions, uh, and uh, and Jeff noodling with the mix for a very very long time. Yeah, and not to mention. Uh, deciding early on that I didn't like the guitar sounds I was getting because I was experimenting with the early uh, plugins for guitars. And initially I'm like, Oh, that's not bad. And then I'm hearing them in context going, I hate the guitar sound and I'm pretty proud of the guitar sound on the rest of the record. So I retract the guitars, try and I'm, you know, I think that was three versions and there's a lot of guitars on there. So it was a lot of retracking. I maybe kept, I kept a few bits you know, I think I kept a few bits and chopped up stuff and produced it in a certain way, but took about three full passes of different, full different guitar parts. And then uh, I felt like, okay, I can live with that. But um, it, it was a good, for, for both of us, I think it was a great sort of, you know, it was a trip down memory lane just to, yeah. just to, to, uh, to record the tune in the first place years after the band had broken up. And yeah. then every, every once in a while when the, when the, the thing would resurface and Jeff would start working on it for a little, for a little while and go, Oh, you know what? Maybe I should record, re-record these guitars here. I'm going to send you a mix, you know? And then, <laughs> and then a year mix later, I'd be like, Hey, I got a, Hey, I got a, hey, I, got a I got, I got live bass on it. You know, I'm going to send you a mix. I'm like, yeah, okay. So, mix yeah. 89. Yeah. And I'm not even joking. I, it got up into the hundreds, I think it, of different versions. There were, there were a lot. Anyway, uh, we've been going on for way too long. So please enjoy um, our, yeah, I don't. I don't know what it is. It's it's the bastard love child of Red Hot Chili Peppers and Tom Waits. Yes, it is falling off the edge of the world.
have it folks that's falling off the edge of the world mystic fools james woods vocals jeff lipka songwriter guitar and vocals mark sinclair on bass and dave patel on drums stay tuned for the end of the podcast we got another little mini interview from mystic fools along with their new song get lit Okay, so now we've come to the part of the podcast where I share with you a story or read to you a article, column, or blog that I've written and shared on guidoperino.com. Today's story is something called, If Nobody Is Listening, Doesn't Apple Make a Sound? It's really a story about a gentleman called Mr. Fellini, who I met. So sit back, have a listen, and I hope you enjoy. If Nobody Is Listening... Does an apple make a sound? I was sitting in the waiting room, looking down at my smartphone, wondering how long I'd have to wait. Nurse, there's a phone call for you, Mr. Fellini. Mr. Fellini, who is it? Nurse, it's your wife, Mr. Fellini. Again, what does she want now? Mr. Fellini moved his IV stand out of the way, as he shuffled himself forward in his chair and pulled himself up, seemingly perturbed to have to go answer the phone at the nurse's station. I wish they'd take this thing off, he muttered, to no one in particular, while his trembling left hand rattled the stand as he maneuvered his way past several other patients in a room that looked like it should host cleaning supplies more than it should waiting patients. Within a few minutes, he returned, hand still shaking, as he slid his feet forward like he was on skates rather than walking 
on the emergency room floors. He turned himself around and fell back into his chair. He sat for a moment with his head down in that small rectangular room where it seemed all of us were about 15 inches from sitting knee to knee across from one another. I've been here since 3 a.m., he said with a self-disbelief chuckle. No one acknowledged him. Came here by ambulance, and then they hooked me up to this thing because they say I'm dehydrated. Again, no one in the room acknowledged him. I raised my head from looking at my smartphone. As I glanced around the room, it didn't appear anyone was listening to him. Everyone was focused on their own issue, their own entertainment outlet, their own limited space. I'm not a doctor, but maybe you should probably drink more water, I said, as I broke the silence in the room and earned a few glances of my own from others. Mr. Fellini seemed surprised to hear someone respond to him. You're probably right, he said, and then quickly pivoted to a different topic. You like apples, he asked. I do, but what's your favorite apple, I asked him. I like gala apples. I don't like Macintosh. They're too soft, he eagerly replied. We went on to exchange a number of beliefs, likes and dislikes about apples. He smiled as we talked. When the discussion about apples was over, he'd throw out some other random comment and we'd chat about that too. It was clear to me from the start that this gentleman had been there for a long time and was there alone as the only coat in the chair next to him appeared to be his. He didn't have a digital connection to the world, as was evident from having to take calls at the nursing station. The only entertainment in the room was a small television that was on a news channel that had been looping the same stories probably all night. I left before finding out how the rest of Mr. Fellini's day went, or if anyone else took up conversation with him. As I reflect on being in the moment of conversation with him, I surmise that he was simply hoping someone would hear him as he uttered random topics aloud. The bonus was being listened to. It's easy with all the different types of noise around us like traffic, fashion, finances, travel, digital services, digital devices, our new obsession with selfies, and the general scutter of life to easily take for granted what we hear when we listen or to be aware of what others hear from us when they listen, or to sometimes make the conscious effort to simply do both. My favorite apple is a honey crisp. What's yours? This is an opinion article by Guido Perino of the Go On With Guido podcast. You can read this and other articles at www.guidoperino.com forward slash blog. Go on with Guido Podcast listeners. Welcome back to the Four Fans Talk Sports, where everyone here is expressing their opinions as fans, just like you. There are no network obligations, no sponsor pressures, no product placement, just pure fandom mania. I welcome back to the panel Brian from Barry, Roland from Windsor, Clark from the Greater Detroit, Michigan, USA area, and of course myself from the Greater Toronto area. Welcome back, everybody. Good to be here. Good to be back. Good to be here. Let's get the ball rolling. We've got a lot to cover in the show. Uh, we're going to kick it off with uh, a new segment called Leave It or Like It. I'm going to rhyme off a topic, and I'm going to go around the table here, and um, we're just uh, going to look for each of you to say, um, you know, leave it or like it when I rhyme off the topic. So I'm going to go with topic one, and I'll go uh, Brian, Clark, and Roland. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. So the first one, Formula One, the Lewis Hamilton attitude. Brian. Like it. I'm going to say leave it. Uh, leave it. And I'm going to go with leave it too. So that's uh, three leave it and one like it. Hmm, interesting. All right. Montreal Canadiens first round controversial pick, Logan Mayu. Brian. Can't believe it. <laughs> Extraordinarily leave, leave that. Leave it somewhere else. Clark says leave it. Rolly. I I didn't have a problem with it, so is that like it? 
Okay, Rolly goes like it. I'm going like it. We're split on that one. I'm sure that's going to come up later in the in the conversation. Number three, Nikita Kucherov. Brian. Like it. Like it. Leave it. Oh, boy. I'm leaving it, too. I'm leaving it. Another split. We're going to talk about that. All right, here's one. We're going sports entertainment. Bill Goldberg comes back to professional wrestling. Brian, leave it or like it. Leave it. Brian's leaving it. Clark. Right, I'm, I'm flipping a coin and saying leave it. Leave it. Same here. Leave it. Leave it. And I'm going leave it too. Move on, Bill Goldberg. All right. Uh, the Tokyo Olympics. Brian. Like it. Leave it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Roll. <laughs> You're going like it? Yep. And I'm going like it too. All right. Blue Jays coming back to Toronto. Brian. Like it. Brian's liking it? Ab absolutely like it. Like it? Roland? Like it. Roland like it? Yep. I'm going like it too. It's nice to have the team back in, in, in the six. Oh, here's one. The NBA Finals. The Bucks versus the Suns. Brian. Like it. Like Way it. Here go Giannis. Antetokounmpo. <laughs> like it. Clark's going to like it. Roly. Leave it. Yeah, you know what? I'm saying leave it too. I, I just, I couldn't get into it. We're going to talk about that. Um, Carrie Price after surgery. Brian. Like it. I like it too. Roll. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I'm going to say leave it. Surprised you, eh, Brian? Surprised you. <laughs> okay, uh, Kawhi Leonard and the misdiagnose again. Brian. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Roll. Leave it. Yeah, I think that's unanimous. We're all saying leave it, eh? Really, again? Come on. All right, last one. The Seattle Kraken expansion draft slash expansion draft rules, I'll say. Brian. Like it. Yeah, like it. I guess I'll go with that too. I will like it. Roland's going to like it. I'm going to leave it. All right. Well, there's no doubt we've got uh, some split decisions on a few things. Uh, but um, for the most part, we've got, we've got some, some good consistency. I think it's going to uh, flush out in some of the conversations we're going to have today. Um, I want to cover off. Stanley Cup is over. We made some predictions. Our, our grand winner is Brian. Um, and so Brian, Brian called it. He said, first he said, give me the bolts and six. And then it, we all had the benefit of watching the first game. And then we did our, our podcast. And then Brian says, I'm changing mine to the bolts and five. And it ended up being the bolts and five. Clark, you called the bolts and six. Roly called the Habs and seven. I called the Habs and six. I was very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> But here's the question. So that's over. Did the right team win? Did Tampa cheat? And what did 18 million over the cap make a difference? And here's something I'm going to throw at you guys because I want to hear your opinion. <clears throat> Are the COVID champs real champs? And what I mean by that is this. The NHL in 2021 had played 56 games. In 2020, they played, some played 68, some played 71. Um, so <laughs> let's answer that one on the back side. First, 18 million over the cap. Did Tampa cheat? Brian. Did Tampa cheat? No, absolutely not. They all, there is no rule that says you couldn't be over the cap and any other team could have been. Um, Clark. Look at Tampa. They Clark. Were, what you want to just go there? What does Clark, yep. Clark got something? What do you got? Oh, yeah. I, well, I'm, not only is there no rule... But when Chicago finished over the cap in 2015, Tampa was one of the teams that said, are we sure we really want to allow this? And the rest of the league said, yeah, we're cool with it. So you can't fault Tampa for it now when they were explicitly told, yeah, go ahead with it six years ago. Roland? Yeah, they didn't cheat. I mean, the way it's been set up. That, that rule, it's a it's a weird rule. It's skewed. It should probably should be changed. It, you know, it shouldn't be allowed to happen, but they were 18 million over the cap. And I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, 
the part that bothered me is is the way Tampa did it, where Kucherov didn't come back the day before. He didn't come back sooner, or he came right on that same day, right? Playoff start, I'm in. And you can tell well, he was he was the best player in the playoffs. But he had to tell he, they, he's been you know, he's been playing and practicing for a long time. No, they didn't cheat. They, didn't they, cheat. they had to do that though. He couldn't he couldn't come back before the before the season ended. Because they were over the cap, so That's right. they they would have. I don't know what the NHL would have done. I, it just wasn't a possibility. When the season was over, he was able to come back. Now, now the eighteen. I just want a clarification here. Eighteen million over the cap. There's been a lot of a lot made about this on the internet and and you know the Twitter rights and all that sort of stuff. Eight million of that was allocated to players who who like they weren't even on the team. They're just gone. They're just they're just players who are gone. They're paying they're paying money out either way. And then the rest of it is the obvious ten million. I tried tooth and nail to figure out how that ten million got sorted out amongst the remaining players. I did find that they ended up playing uh, paying Sergachev and, and I can't remember somebody else some extra dough. And I don't know what they did. They got a few other players or somehow. That money made up was made up in the mix, but Roland. I think it, I think if he would have come back during the season at some point, they would have had to have had to adjust their roster. They would have right. had to have gotten rid of some players, sent sent some to the minors or waived them, or they would have had to do something. That, so that's why he didn't come back. Didn't they try? Didn't they try to do that? Was didn't they try to wait, uh, trade somebody? What was his name? He ended up playing in the playoffs. I, I can't remember his name now. Tyler Johnson. Right. They tried to wait mm-hmm. Tyler Johnson. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe they were trying to make an effort. Who knows, Brian? Yeah. yeah, no, I think they they played by the rules. They did like they took they absolutely played to their advantage, but they played within the rules. Clark pointed it out like six years ago, and yeah. it's been that way every year. There's always been. I think over the course of this whole season, there were 15 teams that were played over the cup. Out of all, out of all 31 teams. Right? I don't like the rule. I, I, I mean, not just for Tampa Bay, not because you know I wanted Canada's team, the Montreal Canadiens, to win. Well, you know, after knocking out the Leafs uh, and, I, and coming back that three to one, Brian, go ahead. But yeah, no, I agree. I think, I think it's a rule that if they change it and it becomes more fair to all teams, that's yeah. great. But the rule is as it is. So what gets me is the Habs fans or the the, the other teams that played Tampa that are whining about it. Get over it. You got beat by a better team. You know what? It's not just one team, though. I mean, every single team made note of it. The Hurricanes made note of it. The Islanders made note of it. Like, every single team was kind of like... They're whining. That's it, what it is. It, They're whining. I think it's because it, so, it was so blatant. It was so blatant. And, Roly, you said it. Hey, right at the end of the season, Kucherov comes back. Clark. None of those teams made that point, though. During the offseason, when the rule could have been changed, it was only a problem once they were faced with it. And I said, I, I said last month when we were talking about this, the NHL will change rules when they see it as a problem. You did say they that. They don't see this as a problem. You did say I, that. I, but did they know Kucherov was going to come back? Oh, it, I know there was buzz about that when he first went on LTIR. So, so I, I, it sounds like, oh, yeah, Brian. No, I was just going to say, look, they were without their best player for the whole season, arguably their best player for the whole season, and they made the playoffs. That counts for something. If you look at it, Montreal scraped in. They were the 16th seed out of 16 teams, right? So Montreal fans, I I think Montreal fans got to be proud of how far their team went, how how absolutely excellent they represented the uh, you know Montreal, Canada during the playoffs. But they got beat by a better team. And so all this whining and all this stuff, it, it, to me, and, and I talked to you about this earlier, it sounds like they're sounding like Republicans in the election saying it was a conspiracy and it was rigged. You know what? You got beat by a better team. Stop whining. Montreal, you're a classy organization. Montreal fans, be classy and don't be sore losers. You, well, you got beat and that's it. I think I think the problem that I had with it and maybe other fans had with it is that they flaunted it. Yeah. Uh, especially after it, okay. you know, after this, after it all ended, it's like, yeah, and look what we did to you, right? All right, so I mean, it just especially Kucherov. I, I kind of respected Kucherov because he's been like a silent player for how many years, and now like after a couple of Bud Light, he kind of lost it, right? So it's let's like, let's hey, good segue. Let's segue into that topic, Nikita Kucherov. So 
Look at drunken and shirtless. Um, I get it. They won the cup. Drunken and shirtless. Uh, takes it an extra step. Starts making fun of the Montreal Canadiens fan for the one for the one game they won. Just just doesn't understand the the passion that the city has and and what they've been through. I guess. And then he goes on and not only wears a shirt that says eighteen million over the cap, mocking mocking the NHL and the hockey world. Then he starts to get his teammates to wear it. So, and then he's, you know, he's in a boat. So I, I don't know. You know, I said, if, if we go back earlier to the leave it or like it, and, and two of us said leave it and two of us said like it, um, you know, you want to talk about being classy and, and not understanding Nikita Kucherov, you couldn't give him to me. I don't care if he would, if he was going to win the rocket Richard award uh, every year. Um, Clark, you're, 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 you're DFHL, the Sim League. I will never trade for, for Nikita Kucherov. <laughs> that's that's how... Well, I will t- if you end up with him somehow, I will take him off your hands. <laughs> Don't worry about yeah. <laughs> I, it. Just to me, it was... You know, there's a way that you want a champion to behave. And he didn't behave like a champion. But you know what, Brian? What you, you've, uh, You're a big hey, Kucherov fan. What do you think? Oh, here, here's... Ovi, Ovi set the precedent a few years ago for, for how Russians deal with winning the Stanley Cup. So uh, we all remember how, how Ovi got a little uh, a little hammered and a little inebriated. And Hey, Kucherov, arguably the best player in the playoffs. He won the Cup. He can do what he wants. Well, um, he, he had a whole, he had a whole year off. His shirt was probably more driven by some of the commentary that was made by people mm-hmm. and that was like stick it sticking it right back at them because they were he there was all this stuff on social media and the twitter accounts saying the 18 million so he you know what i'm gonna get you back i'm gonna flaunt it yeah you know that's what that's where that was from so, i don't think it was classless so i think it was a, a a targeted move to just stick it right back I, at I guess i guess you know to your political reference earlier i guess that you know when others went low he just went low too he couldn't go high so we'll we'll go to Clark on that. I oh absolutely he went low and I yeah it's I, you look back and you go look, you look at Ovechkin and I I'll go back to 2008 and the Red Wings because that's how far back I have to go but that's better than 93. <laughs> uh, that I, Yuri Hoodler was wasted mm. at the <laughs> celebration and I, I you. you Every year, somebody is plastered, and it's I mean, it's a party. It happens. I mean, there are. I mean, it could get a lot worse than somebody get, getting wasted and celebrating. Uh, and yeah, the shirt is flaunting it. Tampa tried to stop it. I mean, they're one of the teams that said this is a bad idea, and the rest of the league said, nope, we're cool with it. So you can't have it both ways with, like, oh, this is bad. Wait, actually, we don't want you to talk about this. I don't know. It's Roland? That's all I got, yeah. Where, where <laughs> you, uh, I, I kind of, you know, talked about it a little bit already. I, I just didn't like the way he behaved, that's all. Maybe they should have gone to somebody else. Bring somebody else in the room. Bring Stamkos into the room. You know, he was uh, he was a lot better when he was up there. I just didn't care for the way you know what Kucherov was doing and saying. I, I when I when you first saw it, I thought he's an idiot. And I thought I like this guy. He's a great player, and I really liked him. And after that night, I thought, what the heck did he do? Why would you do that? But I guess I don't know. Maybe it's part of the celebration, but I didn't like it. Absolutely. I I hope the Habs never trade for the guy. I like I don't want it to be a, like a Kovalev thing. I don't have to worry about that. I don't think he would go. And I just I don't think he understood. I don't think he understood Montreal as a city. I don't think he understood um, what hockey means um, there when he made some of the comments, even about the fans uh, celebrating. Um, and I just thought it was a it was a selfish moment for uh, it was a selfish NHL moment. It was disappointing to see that. But speaking of behaviors. The Euro Cup. <laughs> the Euro Cup is over. We had some predictions there. Um, segwaying into that, the highlight in the last game was Chiellini and the clothesline. Uh, I'm shocked it wasn't, and I'm going with that with the behavior. I can't believe it was uh, 
it wasn't a red card or a yellow card or anything. <laughs> it was, I thought I was watching wrestling there for a moment, even, even though I was like, hey, yeah, I, I wanted to see Italy win that game, which they did. Um, but Clark, you, you had called uh, Italy versus Denmark with an Italy win. Denmark didn't quite make it. Um, and that was controversial too. That was a, another controversial yes. sort of, it, maybe it should have been Italy versus Denmark, right? Um, Brian, you called Italy versus England with an England win. Roly, you called Italy versus England with an Italy win. And I called Italy versus England with an Italy win. Um, there's that. And then, you know, the, the thing that kind of led some of these teams to the final was the penalty kicks to end the games. I don't know. Was that... So a couple of things there, guys. Kalini in the clothesline, penalty kicks to end the game. Did, did we like it? Did we like how Euro Cup ended? Brian? Well, listen. First off, I, I picked England. I, I went with my home. But I think... <laughs> It was an excellent, uh, an excellent final. I think uh, from my vantage point, England maybe dominated the first 10 minutes of that game, and then Italy took over and they dominated the rest. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know what? Penalty kicks mm-hmm. not the best way to end the game. I love NHL playoff hockey, but I just don't think with those guys after playing, you know, 90 minutes plus another 30, you, it would be, it would just be silly to try and get these guys to play. So that's. It's the same for both teams. Uh, Italy uh, Italy won the penalty kicks, won the tournament. And the thing that I, I really felt bad for was just the way those uh, the English players got treated after the ones that did take the penalty kicks. That was, you know, it, there's always something that's really glorious about something, and then it gets brought down. And that was really sad to see the English players get uh, get crucified on uh, social media. Yeah, I, I agree. That was, that was uh, probably a... A stain, a stain on on the game a bit there, right, Clark? Yeah, I, that's I, I, that's definitely a stain, like you said. And on the idea of penalty kicks to end the game, I think I said last time around. I, no, I don't like penalties to end the game, but those are the rules. And that England Denmark game, <laughs> I, you know, I have to, I, I had to hop into a meeting right after that with an England supporter. <laughs> Uh, who was very thrilled about it. And, you know, I would say a weak way to win a game is on a the rebound of a penalty off of a weak call. But as I was told then, those are the rules. So England can take those are the rules now. Right. <laughs> revenge. Reve- the Denmark revenge. I got it. How about you, yes. Roland? Uh, first on Chiellini. He should have at least gotten a yellow card. I don't know what the ref... I, uh, maybe they weren't looking at anything. I have no idea how they missed that call. At least a yellow card. Uh, the penalty kicks? Like, yeah, they can't play forever. You got 11 guys on the field. I, I you know, I think it only changed how many players? Five players? Yeah. During that, you know, during the game, England did the same thing. Uh, they, it's got to end somehow. The, the part that I didn't like with England is... What the uh, manager did at the end, he brought some players late into the game to take the penalty kicks. They were cold. They're great players, but he brought them in for that specific reason. And the poor, you know, uh, one guy hit the post. I felt sorry for that 19-year-old. The last, you know, English player to take to take that penalty kick, 19 years old, in front of that crowd. It's yeah. a man. Can you imagine the pressure? And the poor kid missed. And then, like Brian said... They kind of got attacked after that. It's like because they, you know, they lost the game. But I, penalty kicks, they can go either way. I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a crapshoot, right? It can go either way. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the penalty kicks, but I think in in soccer and like I think Brian, you said it. After after you've played that amount of time, what do you do? Like yeah. these guys yeah. can't die on the field, right? Like it's just that type of game, Brian. Yeah, I just want to go on record as I've been supporting of refs, and I've heard both of you guys who are Italy supporters call out your own guy and the ref for not calling a penalty on your own guy. As an England fan, I haven't said anything about the ref. So I'm not making a big deal about it. And there's a lesson learned for you guys. You got to bring you got to bring the refs in. Eh? It was gracefully. I could have gone, oh, England got ripped off. They should have been up one player, right? I didn't. No, they should have. My question is, was Italy over the cap? <laughs> I you know what they weren't? They weren't shirtless and drunken. That's what they weren't. (laughs) 
they 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 celebrated with some class on the bus, and uh, you know, yeah. from what we oh, saw, it was, great, it was a great game. That was a yeah, it was. Awesome it game. was. Yeah. You want to talk about being glued to your TV set? What a game! Yeah, it it really was. It was it was entertaining, and exciting. I still say Chiellini should have gotten card or thrown, won. but the best team won. Italy dominated. They, they did. You know what? Even the semis, the semifinals were great games. Both games were great games. Italy, Spain, and and Denmark, England, they were great games. I actually yeah. thought the last couple of games, Italy, Italy got off their game uh, a bit in terms of what they had done. You know, the thirty previous matches and stuff. There was a couple of times they kind of got off their game a bit, and I thought, oh, oh, what are they? You know, what are they doing or whatever? But I think the, um, you know, when we get to the World Cup, it's going to be a different story because you're going to have. You're going to have some other, other teams, of course, outside of Europe that are going to make a, a real big difference. So it'll be interesting to see where, where that team ends up. Uh, but talking about teams and, and, and moving forward and moving on, the NHL gets a new team, the Seattle Kraken. Um, the draft happens. Uh, maybe some surprises, maybe not. Carey Price is available and they don't take Carey Price. Now, I got to wonder, you know, what did, did he conveniently... Uh, you know, have have uh, uh, an injury, and and was there doubt, and you know, was it a well played card by by Mark Bergen? I don't know, uh, but it's the timing is really is really interesting. But the the Kraken don't take price. Um, they have about twenty five million dollars left in cap space. They they could spend up to eighty one and a half. That might I think it was twenty nine. They've eaten some of that up with some signings the last few days. Um, what are the Seattle Kraken in season one? Why don't they take price and what are they in season one? Clark, let's let's start with you. I, I'm confused because I, like, I, I, I think you could look at their expansion draft and say, okay, they're, they're going young. They're trying not to be uh, invested long term in a lot of people. You look at that. Uh, they got their three goalies, and that's the thing that I, I, I'm looking at. That's like, okay, they've got their goalies. They're not they're not trying to be a goalie broker. None of that stuff. And then they go out inside group hour away from the abs for a decent chunk of change. And I don't think getting him is a bad deal, but okay. Now you're a goalie broker because you got to move one of those guys and the goalie market's already insane. And what are you doing there? And uh, they, they, they seem to be throwing a little bit of money around in ways that didn't seem I, like, it, I, I don't think, that a Ron Francis team would have done. It, yeah. it didn't look quite like that. So I don't know. I don't know what to expect from them. They're 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 confusing me a bit. Roland? Yeah, I'm a little bit with Clark here as well. You know, they've gone young in a lot of areas. I didn't think they wanted to spend that kind of money. I, I, they didn't want to load up like uh, like Vegas loaded up in their first year. They're gonna have I think they're gonna be competitive. But they're not going to be like Vegas. They might even miss the playoffs. I, I I don't see them making the playoffs with that roster unless Francis does something else, uh, you know, picking up other players. But I think they'll be competitive. But uh, and, and not going with Price. All I heard during all of that is that cap money is gold. It's gold right now, right? Yep. And nobody wants to spend to the cap because you saw what teams had to go through last year, right? So uh, maybe that that factored into uh, I think uh, what Ron Francis did there as well. Brian, yeah, yeah no, I I I think to Roland's point, I think they the price was a little too expensive. He would have, you know, it was and it was that do we spend the money and 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 lose all that cap space to have an absolute bona fide face of the franchise? I think that's where Vegas hit when they got Flurry. <clears throat> he became the, the 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 face of the franchise, and I, I'm really disappointed in how he just got treated with that trade to Chicago. It's, it's sad on Vegas, but but I think they went with another way, and uh, I wasn't surprised at all that they passed over on price. But I, I I agree. I don't. I think they'll be they'll be competitive, but I I I think they'll be a middle of the pack, and, and there there's still some trades and some free agent signings left to come for the for those guys. So it's going to be interesting to see how they what their roster is on day one. I I'm with you. I'm with that's this good. I'm I'm with you, Clark. I I have no idea what this team is. I I don't like. I get it. Like you know, they might have added Giordano and they might have added Eberle, um, you know, to maybe bring some of the younger guys along and and you know give some stability and 
Um, and then they go and sign Grubauer. I, I have no idea what they are. I don't know if they're trying to go young and miss the playoffs and, and get more picks or um, if they're somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah. I, yeah, but you, you mentioned Giordano and like at during the expansion draft when he's announced and everything, he looked like he was miserable there. <laughs> and like, I, so I, I like I get he's been with the Flames forever and he was their captain and he yeah. probably didn't want to be picked, but he looked miserable <laughs> and you kind of got to wonder, like, does he really want to be there? And there's plenty of time between now and the start of the season. So that could change. But it was just that's your first like the, the 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 first look at one of your new players and like and, and, he's, and he's all oh it's hard to leave that team <laughs> yeah i and that's where i say you know a uh, carry price as much as i don't i didn't want to see him leave montreal i thought he was gonna go because i thought face of the franchise he's so calm in a new in a new market he would bring that calm to that team he would you know bring calm to the fan base I thought they're going to pay the money just to get that level of stability. But hey, my my Montreal Canadiens still have a really good goalie on their hands. So that that's cool. We'll see what the Seattle Kraken become. Um NBA Finals I mentioned at the beginning. Uh the Bucks and Suns, uh Bucks come out on top. I wrote down here in my notes, did anyone watch it? I I couldn't get into it. Um, and not because I'm a, I mean, I don't really have a favorite uh, basketball team. Hey, I'm living, living in the GTA. You hear a lot about the Raptors and yeah, I was at the Raptors parade when they won and, and checked it all out being in the moment sort of thing. Um, I didn't, I don't think I, I might've watched some highlights and thought to myself, nah, all right. <laughs> but, I don't know. Brian, did you watch it? Yeah, I did. We, when I was, uh, except for when I was at the cottage, which you know where that is and there's no TV up there. So and, and listening to basketball on the radio just isn't the same as listening to hockey on the radio. But when I was home, I, I caught it. I'm a, I'm a huge Giannis uh, Antetokounmpo fan. I think he's a, a he, he lives up to the billing. And uh, it was good to see uh, see the uh, the Bucks come out ahead, and uh, he's a deserving a deserving champion. So uh, yeah, it was it was exciting to watch. I watched the uh, I watched the final game. How, how about you, Clark? You know, I, I'm not a big basketball fan. I didn't watch, uh, but one of my good friends is a huge Bucks fan, so I'm glad for the Bucks on her behalf. <laughs> cool. Go Bucks, Roland. I didn't watch any of it. I didn't watch <laughs> any basketball at all. I'm shocked. I'm shocked. I didn't. Like I used to be. And Clark probably knows when the Pistons were around, the big Pistons teams, and maybe because of our vicinity with, with Detroit, you know, I was into that. Uh, even Toronto, uh, you know, the last couple of years with Toronto, I, you know, I was watching a little bit of that. This year, it's like I just couldn't watch any basketball. I just did not get into it at all. Yeah, I, I, I'm surprised that you couldn't because you, you used to keep your own stats on this stuff, but um, you didn't even trust, you didn't even trust the sports sites to give you stats. You kept your own stats on, on the NBA and other things like that. So, I couldn't get into it. But I, hey, congrats to the Bucks. Um, looks like they had a, a good run and a good team. Too bad for uh, you know we talked about Kawhi Leonard at the at the start there as well. That seems to be another another situation going on there. Unfortunately, maybe I wonder if he should not have left the Toronto Raptors. Maybe maybe that was the team that understood him. I I don't know. You know, I'm not starting any rumors here. I'm not not pulling a not pulling a you know some some other sports show rumor thing rumor mill here where they're going to say Kawhi's back to uh, Toronto. But who knows? Um, but there is another thing going on called the Olympics. And um, I am saying go Canada, go. Canada is number 11 right now. They've got um, two gold. What do they got? Two gold, three silver, four bronze. They've got nine medals. Um, I think they're all, they're all women who are winning right now who, who got all the medals. I don't think there's any uh, men's. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, we've got softball. Synchronized three meter springboard, um, judo, several swimming, hundred meter backstroke, two hundred meter freestyle. Are you guys uh, watching the Olympics, Brian? Yeah, I've been watching a little bit. Uh, I watched some of the highlights. It's wacky because the timing's all different because of being in Japan and that. Yeah. Little bit of mixed feelings about 
the Olympics even going on with all the COVID, they're having a, yeah. a terrible situation over there. And that's that's a bit of a shame. That's a bit of a, a detriment to it. But hey, it's exciting to see the Olympics. They're always exciting. I got to say the highlight for me so far was watching the table tennis gold, the ping pong gold medal <laughs> match between China and Japan. Well, I don't know if anyone else saw it. The way these guys play table tennis is unbelievable. It's unreal. I used to have a. I think it should be an international sport. Toronto should get a ping pong team. I used to. I used to. I used to have a ping my own ping pong paddle, and I would play a lot when I was in uh, university. I was uh, I was pretty good, I was just, but yeah. um, I never made any championships. How about you, Ron? You watching the Olympics? I am, I, but um, like Brian said, catching things here and there. It's so split up. Like they'll go from one thing to another to another, and I'm going, wait a minute, I was just getting into that, and it's we're yeah. moving on. Maybe the swimming, the swimming's a little different because they, you know, you see the whole race. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm watching it and, you know, cheering for Canada. And it's, yeah, I, I find the Olympics enjoyable. The only thing I don't like is there's no fans. And that's that's one of the biggest things of, of the Olympic, right? That that whole atmosphere, that, that global get-together. And it's just not there. Yeah. Clark, you, you must be happy that the United States are in first. They've got 11 <laughs> gold, 11 silver, 9 bronze, 31 total medals. Are you Are you watching it from that perspective? You know, you know, I'm follow, I'm following along a little bit more. I'm following along more on Twitter than I am on like actual broadcasts or anything. Uh, when highlights get, I'm tweeted into my timeline and I'm taking a look at that. Um, it's hard because, like uh, Brian said, it really feels like they shouldn't be happening. Uh, with yeah. all the uh, the COVID issues over there, uh, it's really I mean the COVID issues everywhere really. It's not right. gone even in places where we're acting like it's gone, uh, and uh, it's it, it so so that is kind of a downer. The, because of that, the fans aren't there. It's a downer. It just really kind of feels like why are they doing this? And I mean why are they doing this? Is because Japan spent a ton of money on stadiums and you gotta fill or you gotta put stuff in there. Um, and then it's okay. It's all about money, and it's okay. Exactly. There's another downer, um, but uh, I mean, it, it's downers all around because the big. I mean, the big thing and that we're that is getting all the buzz in the U.S. is the gymnastics team and Simone Biles, and I, right. she's taking so much flack uh, for her, I mean, her decision to I mean, to step down essentially, and it's I, it, it's really hard to see that because. If somebody, if you if you looked at someone and they said, "I broke my ankle, I can't make this jump, I'm I, I'm stepping down," you would understand that. But she's saying something's wrong in my head. I can't land this jump, mm-hmm. and I, and that's suddenly unacceptable. Right. And, and it's I, I, it is a it, it is a sign of how much we don't take mental health seriously. And I really hate seeing that. Hundred percent, hundred percent, Clark. Hundred percent. Yep, I agree yeah. with you as well. Yeah. Yep. Well said, Clark. Yeah. So I, guys, I was originally when I did the leave it or like it, I was gonna say leave leave the Olympics because my first instincts were like, let's just deal with the pandemic, and and you know, I'm I'm not ready to deal with this and and the no fans, but we we have other sports without fans, but it was mostly the pandemic. But I went with like it because you still have a bunch of athletes who are are persevering and showing resilience. And and Clark, even even to your to your example from a mental health perspective, um, you know, I I think you have to respect that uh, that person and that ability, and that maybe we're breaking some ground um, in the future. Um, and there seems to be a lot of that uh, those opportunities these days where where we wanna we wanna get to. We want to get to everybody's understanding of normal and have that uh, be an acceptable thing. Um, guys, with that said, we've, we've hit our four. We're going to go to the four on fours here. And this is the part of the show where each of you, uh, each of us gets uh, one minute or less to talk uh, uninterrupted about uh, whatever it is that you want to talk about. So I'm going to start it off with Brian. You, uh, you go ahead, then we'll uh, go over to Clark, Roland, and then I'll, I'll close it out. So... Well, I'm going to surprise you because I think you thought I was probably going to, based on some Twitter uh, or some uh, texts back and forth between you, I'm sure you were betting I was going to talk about Logan and my Lou drafting in Montreal, but I'm not going to uh, spend another minute on that. 
My uh, at the last at the la- our last podcast, I did a topic called "Old Guys Rule," and I was talking about Spezza and Perry. Uh, my topic for this one is "Young Gays Rule," and I wanted to do a shout out to Luke Prokop, the first uh, openly gay uh, pro uh, hockey player that's uh, on the cusp of joining the NHL had the courage and conviction to come out and uh, has uh, set himself up as a bit of uh, a bit of hero to to a lot of people as someone that's got got that courage and, and strength and I think he's going to uh, he's going to have a great career I know that a lot of people uh, in the media a lot of people in the NHL brass and certainly the team that he's on have all shown their support so I think this bodes well and I think it's taken it now beyond pride nights and rainbow colored uh, hockey tape on sticks to actually a, a real human that, that people can see that there's uh, there's meaningful change happening in the league. So congrats to Luke Prokop. And I think it's uh, it's a great thing. Well, well said. Well said, Brian. Uh, Clark. Yeah, uh, if Brian had not gone with Luke Prokop, I might have done that. Uh, but he skipped over Logan Mayu and I can't. Uh, so I am going to go there and, uh, I'm just going to say, I, I was watching the draft. Uh, I, I, my, my wife and I were watching the draft with a friend of ours who's not a hockey fan. Uh, and we were explaining everything to her, how it worked, all that stuff throughout the many hours. Cause the first round drags on. And, uh, we're, as we're going along, she's getting really excited about how the draft works and she's getting really into the salary cap and she's the numbers and how does, how does all this work and how do you know players fit in? And she wants to know how it all works and she's excited about it and then we get to pick number 31 and we explain why that why we're shocked about that and she's done because she and she does not feel like this is a league that has the safety and mental health to go there of uh, of its female fans at heart and I can't blame her. And we can talk about whether or not he deserves a second chance, whether or not he's even done with his first chance. What does a second chance look like? All of that stuff, the way it happens, alienates fans. And that is undeniable. Thank you, Clark. Roland. Uh, I, I, I had the same topic. Uh, and maybe, you know, I'm sitting on the other side of the fence. Uh, I wrote a few things down. It's like, I don't have a problem because the journalists were attacking Montreal. It's like, what a horrible pick. They shouldn't have done it. Uh, Blasting the Canadians, calling them all kinds of names and things like that, right? So I don't have a problem with Montreal's draft pick. Uh, Did the kid make a horrible, horrible mistake? Yes, uh, he did. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And uh, you have to feel for the victim as well, right? So what he did... And, and the other individual involved. But with today's social media world, anyone can do and say something, and the entire world wants to cancel them out of existence. We have to remember, he's only 17 years old, right? He made a, 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 just a stupid mistake. But that's not how society works. Surely, you know, we can give him a second chance. Second chances is what makes our society functional in, in a democratic world, right? I'm not sure what the hockey world wants from this young man right now. I believe he, like, what, what he did, he knows he, he did it wrong. One sports writer said of Montreal that the selection was, was wrong. He, he should not have selected them during the draft. Yet he said, if they, if they would have waited and, and did it later on, then it would be okay. And I'm going, well, what's the difference? What's the difference whether you pick them now or pick them later, right? There's another player now, that Tony uh, D'Angelo. Racist remarks, uh, homophobic statements. The Rangers dropped them, weighed them, bought them out. Carolina's looking to pick him up now, right? I don't know if they signed him or not. I, I don't know. But it's, it's a weird world we're living in right now. And to, <clears throat> I look at it as a 17-year-old, and I'm going, yeah, you made, you made a horrible mistake here. But we can't just say to the kid, you're done. You're done. It's over. Your life is over. And you're not able to move on from this. And you can tell he's, he's kind of suffering. I've seen him. I've watched him on TV. I've seen his interviews. He's probably seeing a psychologist right now or psychiatrist. The kids suffer. And, and the, the women as well. Uh, like the young girl, 
you know, that this happened to as well. So, you know, I don't have a problem with Montreal's draft pick. So I think that as much as uh, it's come up here, this is certainly reflective of what's going on online. Um, I'm going to offer you my uh, closeout uh, statement here. Um, it's probably not as direct as everybody else's. It's a little bit more on the abstract side. So uh, I'll let you uh, absorb it. Hey, sports world, breathe. Yeah, you. Media and Judgment Day Reapers. Just because you're the fastest to report a story doesn't mean it's the most accurate or that you're doing it in a way that best serves the fan, the athlete, or any peripheral friends, family, acquaintances, or otherwise. What's the cost for the 15 minutes of fame you're hunting for to those that you are hunting? Let, let me let you in on a little secret. Nobody on this earth is perfect. And when you think you've found that, chances are the definition for perfect changed long before you found your holy grail. That doesn't mean we compromise reasonable accountability, but that we at least make a reasonable and responsible effort. But I get it. If you don't quite understand what I'm saying, let me lean on some music, as it is often intertwined with sport, and quote this from Billy Joel's The Stranger. You may never understand how the stranger is inspired, but he isn't always evil, and he is not always wrong. Though you drown in good intentions, you will never quench the fire. You'll give in to your desire when the stranger comes along. So, check the stranger in yourself the next time you're about to report or comment on a story. Check to see what mask you're wearing or how short your cape is before you fly. That's the end of the four on four. Is any rebuttals out there or comments or questions to anybody else? One, one each. Sure, I'll go ahead. I I think I think the, the the pick by Montreal, although probably a good hockey a hockey pick, he's certainly rated higher than thirty first. So from a hockey sense, from a pure hockey sense, it's a good pick. From a pure organizational and societal sense about what's going on around, I think it was very short sighted. And you're starting to see the repercussions of it. I think that Montreal Canadiens, and forget the media, and forget the the, the, the kid. I deserve, I agree, deserves a second chance, and 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 we'll we'll grow from this hopefully and get the help that he needs, right? But I think the kid asked to be to be passed over in the draft. He he himself said, "I'm not worthy of being drafted this year." And 30 teams before Montreal, because arguably he was rated well higher than 31st, obeyed that wish. So I think very short-sighted on Montreal. They're possibly going to lose sponsorships. They've alienated a whole host of female fans and male fans. And I think it was just a poor, a poor organizational decision, but probably a good hockey decision. That's my perspective on it. My only thing with that, so what makes hockey special? Why is hockey the league that says, we don't do this kind of stuff? We're not going to get involved in any of this. I mean, you, you look at the other leagues. In the NFL, the NBA, you have these kids coming in. That Almost all of them, or a good percentage of them, have problems, have criminal records coming into the leagues. And if they don't have them coming into the league within the first or second year, a lot of them do get into trouble and end up having a criminal record. I don't know why we're, especially the reporters, are holding hockey at such a different level. We don't know what goes on in, in players' lives. I bet you a lot of things go, go on that we don't even hear about from, from teams and, and, and within the league. I'm sure we don't. So I don't, I don't think hockey should be held at that higher pedestal. I do understand. I, I absolutely agree that what he did was horrible. And, uh, I mean, it was a huge mistake, but we shouldn't bury him. I, I guess, I, I, number one, I would love to see the stats that the other leagues have so many criminals in them. That feels made up to me. No. And I'm, I, I would love to see those numbers. Uh, no, number two, the idea that this kid is like, that anybody is saying his life should be over for this. No. What that maybe he does not deserve to be picked in the NHL draft this year. What he doesn't deserve to be one of the 200 and change players in the entire world picked in the draft this year. 
or he doesn't deserve to be one of the 32 in the world picked in the first round. I, that that is not the worst thing for him to suffer, and the and then to touch on his suffering, the fact that he is seeing a, a, a psychiatrist about this. I'm seeing a psychiatrist. Lots of people see psychiatrists or counselors or all that. That goes back to normalizing mental health. It is good. Lots of people should do it. I recommend it for everyone. Having someone to talk to is great. And to put it as, oh, well, he's seeing a psychiatrist, so he must show remorse or there must be something wrong or there must – any of that stuff is – just it, it feels wrong to me. No one is saying he right. can't. No one is saying he can't continue his career. He can't any of that stuff. Just hey, maybe we take a breather for a second and Brian, let him grow. What I was saying is that he's getting help. He's and and the organization saying they're going to help him as well. So he's getting help. Brian. Yeah, I just want to make clear. I don't think any of us or any of the media, for that matter, are going after the kid. So I think when you say the media are going after the kid, that's mistaken. The media is going after the Habs for making the selection. They are, nobody is crucifying the kid in the media. The Habs, by making the pick, put him again in the spotlight. They did the kid a disservice. He recognized the error of his ways and said, I do not want to be drafted. And he asked. Please do not draft me this right. year. But but we're gonna so we're gonna we're gonna take the word of a seventeen year old kid who says don't draft me. We're gonna believe him then, but we're not gonna believe him on on the other side when he says I'm sorry. So it's interesting to me, guys, because here's what I hear. Here's what I think. You're all right. Everybody here, every point everybody made here today is a is a very good point. But you know who we haven't talked about? We haven't talked about the NHL. Who's to blame here? For me, it's the NHL. Because if the NHL thinks, and, and they should have, they should have had the foresight to go, you know what? Hey, you're going to take a break this year. Uh, we're going to revisit you. You're yep. going to take a break. Thank you for now. Thank you for having the maturity to, to figure out on your own. But we're with you. Because you I know agree. what? Here's one thing we all know. The GMs in the NHL, they can't control themselves. If you give them an opportunity to go over the cap, they're going to go over the cap. If you give them an opportunity to draft someone that they sh that we all think maybe take a break and don't, they they're gonna do it because it's just the nature of of their business and the game. I'm not excusing anything that had happened. I'm not excusing and and the the one good thing is Jeff Molson put out a statement today saying, look, we get it, we get that we've done something wrong as an organization, um, but we're here's a bunch of things that we're gonna do to try and at least make this better. And they've excused him from training camp and a whole bunch of other things. To me, though, guys, the it starts and ends with the NHL and and them washing their hands. There's a there's a lot of people in history who washed their hands and said, "Hey, it's not on me. My blood is the blood's not on my hands." Well, that's what the NHL is doing here. Brian, close it out. We got to yeah, close I this out. Yeah, I want to make one quick yeah. comment, and it, it this is where it's a bit of a shame. It's a bit of a shame. And that's why I, I, I say it was a bit of a short-sighted decision by Montreal because they should have seen this reaction coming. It's a bit of a shame that they had such a tremendous run in the playoffs. They were ending on such a high and such a great reputation with the team. And now they're buried and marred in this controversy. And it's a, it's a real shame for the organization, but they did it to themselves. Clark? I, you mentioned the Molson statement, and I maybe I'm a cynic, but that statement came out at 12:30 on free agency day. It was timed perfectly to be completely ignored. There's there's yeah, there's right, that the there's that aspect. Jardin and other sponsors started to say they were reconsidering their sponsorship. There's so there's, it's a little bit of reaction to that as well. There's that aspect too, but look, guys, this is the Montreal Canadiens. They, all, all things being said, they've got hundreds of years of class that that teams today and players today can't show in 15 seconds. Never, awesome. never mind, never mind 15 minutes of poor judgment. So when they say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna put these programs in place," they have credibility. I I'm gonna believe it. They got a, a lot I, more. They got a lot more credibility than the NHL. They got a lot more credibility than 
Tom Wilson or Tony D'Angelo or Patrick Kane or Austin Matthews. I, now the Leafs, are, Leaf, Leafs Nation is going to be all over me because I said that. But there's a lot of situations out there that, that aren't that far off from this. The only difference that I saw here is that the mistake happened. There's some accountability. There's some an incredible amount of healing. And and I know you guys want to keep talking about this. And this is this has been going on on like I'm telling you, we're doing a show here about how the fans talk about it. And this is this is the the realest that we're gonna get to it. Um, but so uh, one more comment to each of you, and we got to close it out because we're way over time. Roland, I'll let you go. I, I was just going to say, look what's going on in Chicago right now. What is going on in Chicago with all this stuff? And we, these are adults, and these are like an adult men, adult players that have been there for years, and this right. is going on. And it's almost like it's they're initially tried to bury it, and now yeah. it's coming out. So there's stuff that's going on. It's like, what is going on in the league? And you know what? And again, like, look, I think there's bigger problems yep. there for the league. Step up at crazy. Step up NHL, Clark. I, Guido, you talked about the, I, the the Canadians and their history. And Roland, you talked about Chicago. The connection is Mark Bergevin. So I, Mark Bergevin was there in Chicago when that was happening. With him, with the Canadians, can you trust that, Brian? He, yeah, and I just think I think you know we made the comments about what happened in Chicago. You don't like it. It happened while the players were there. What happened with some other players? And you're saying if somebody picks up D'Angelo, that's a bad move. So here's Montreal not having a player like an existing player, but taking on a new player that's got this. They had a choice in it. They didn't have a player that all of a sudden did something. They made a decision to job interview. Somebody's got this, a, a sex offender. Yeah. And yeah, we want to bring you into our organization. That was a conscious choice on them and they're suffering the repercussions of it. This conversation has been very real, um, very reflective of what is going on in the conversations out on the social media world and news world with respect to this story. It's obviously not to be taken uh, lightly, and you can see how the very many different perspectives are approaching it. We're going to bring this conversation to a conclusion today, but I'd like to thank Brian, Roland, and Clark uh, for participating and reflecting the many views that are out there. That's for fans talk sports on the Go On With Google podcast. Thanks for listening. So folks, when we stopped recording and kind of went off the air on this topic, the panel continued to talk. In fact, they continued to talk for about another half hour. Um, and that's uh, that's the impact of um, the situation with respect to this. So I didn't want to just leave it that way. Um, what I wanted to do is leave you with a letter that uh, was referenced that uh, Jeff Molson, the owner of the Montreal Canadiens, um, issued. Uh, on uh, July 28th, and it reads as follows. Message to everyone impacted by our decision. I want to share with you my perspective on our decision to select Logan Malou in the 2021 NHL draft. This decision, made in the context of the draft, turned out to be instantaneously very offensive to many of you. I understand that you expect more from us, and we let you down. The Montreal Canadiens are more than a hockey team. Logan's actions do not reflect the values of our organization, and I apologize for the pain this selection has caused. First and foremost, regarding the young woman who is the victim, I want to say that we do not minimize what she has had to and continues to have to live through. No one, especially not an 18-year-old, should have to suffer through a traumatic experience like this. We are there to support her and her family and respect their privacy. Our selection of Logan was never intended to be disrespectful towards her or her family, or more generally towards women or other victims of similar situations. Our decision was not intended in any shape or form to be an endorsement of the culture of violence against women. Logan is a young man who committed a serious transgression. He is genuinely remorseful about the pain he has caused. He is committed to becoming a better person, and we will work with him through this process. At this stage, 
It is only our actions that will speak louder than our words. One, over the course of the next few months, we will develop in conjunction with local experts a comprehensive plan to raise awareness and educate young men and young women about this serious issue. We will use our platform and our resources to turn a decision that hurt many people into one that brings meaningful and impactful change. Two, we will support and oversee Logan's commitment to becoming a better person. Three, we've asked Logan not to participate in our rookie or main training camp this fall. Being a player in the NHL is a privilege that is earned, not a right that is granted. As the year progresses, we will reassess Logan's readiness to be part of our organization. We gave Logan a second chance, but in doing so, we failed to properly assess the impact of our decision on the victim and anyone who have suffered in similar circumstances. Once again, I want to apologize to everyone impacted by our decision. I repeat, our actions will speak louder than our words. We will work to continue proving we are an organization this community and our fans can be proud of. Lastly, I want to thank everyone that provided their feedback on this situation, including our partners and sponsors, so that this mistake becomes an opportunity to grow and raise awareness. Jeff Molson, owner, president, and chief executive officer. So there you have it, folks. There's the statement. Digest it as you will. And in the end, it's always important to keep the conversation going. Well, I hope you're enjoying the podcast this month. Like I said, it's content filled. Lots of cool, cool things happening here. We're going to go back to the Mystic Fools. And Jeff and James are going to be talking to us about their newer song called Get Lit. So let's listen in on Jeff and James. Hey there. Okay, so the other tune we're talking about today uh, that you're going to hear is called Get Lit. And uh, this this tune was a blast to write. And unlike the other tune, it actually, the music and lyrics and everything came together very quickly because I work well on deadlines, typically. Um, we had been invited to play a 420 event at a big uh, theater that was doing sort of a multimedia uh, thing. And I thought, hey, you know, it'd be really cool if I write a song with the idea that it's we're doing a 420 thing. Well, I finished it by then. I don't think we recorded it. We may have done a pass at recording it. Actually, I think we did a pass at it, uh, but we didn't really have it ready for the gig. Um, although we did, we play it. I feel like we played it. I don't remember. I don't remember. It was a 420 thing. None of us were smoking or anything, but the theater was packed with pot smoke. So that might explain uh, not really remembering what we did. I have all um, kinds of reasons for that, but you go ahead. You, t- um, you tell that story. Um, yeah, but I wanted... Oh, go ahead. Take it away. N- no, 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 no. No, you, please. Um, but yeah, so lyrically, I wanted to... I wanted to it, it's going to be a positive tune. This was uh, still in the prohibition era of marijuana. And uh, I just wanted sort of to have a somewhat rational yet fun view looking at it and sort of a throwback, I suppose, to the hippie days of, Hey, you know, we should all feel good about each other and feel together. And, and that was kind of the impetus for writing the song. And it actually came together really quickly and was a lot of, a lot of fun to do. And James, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we did all the vocals and maybe one session or maybe one short session and one longer session. I feel like it wasn't a whole lot of times like the other one. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it was. I don't think it was as crazy. Um, I don't know if we did. I don't know if we did the bridge in a separate section or if it was just like a really really long day. But I because I because there's so, there's so much sure. on like that uh, on the the peace love and understanding section that I which is my favorite thing actually the whole the whole. Oh, right on. Uh, song is that whatever happened to peace, love, and understanding? I uh, just, yeah, just, yeah, I love that. I love yeah, and that you, line and so you much. killed, the, you killed all the vocals and the. There's lots of great harmony parts on. Uh, th- you'll hear it, but throughout throughout the song, and particularly that part, I really, I really dig as well. You know what? There's there is something that I love, and I don't know. I don't know how it came about, and I don't re- and I don't even I don't remember either of us doing it, but there's. There is that little sort of woo of party 
it's supposed to be like party sounds behind one of the behind like the second line in each uh in each verse sure where people go like <laughs> <"Woo!"> <laughs> I, I i actually I, was I that you remember do i yeah that was me i remember doing that once and really digging it and going oh we need this as a little bit of a hook and i tracked i think i tracked myself three times and just like harmony parts uh for it i I think that's most of the vocals I did on that one and maybe a bit of really low stuff uh, during the pseudo rap breakdown. I think I did a little of the low stuff with you just to kind of get that dance hall feel. So, yeah, I kind of wanted bits of it. There's an instrumental section here. You'll hear that I was trying to get a dance hall thing, but but not so much with electronic instruments, but with try to recreate it with mostly using guitars, which I love it. I think it came out really great. Um, and the rest was just supposed to be a groovy, fun tune. And my initial idea for it was to have a drum loop because a lot of that was going on, uh, still is at the time. And I spent a fair bit of time programming the, the drums. And again, I wasn't not happy with it, but I just kept feeling like, oh, there could be more to this. This could, there, there's, I wonder if I send it to a drummer. It took me years to do that. Um, but when was it, James? Maybe five, six months ago. I don't even remember. who. Oh, right, right, right. Cause you got a, you've got a, another great drummer on this track too. So a buddy of mine's name is uh, Marita Marquez and he is just a phenomenal, phenomenal, another phenomenal now Toronto drummer originally from Portugal. And he's played, uh, he's currently playing with Jesse cook, but he's also played on a, I think he, Oh, he may have produced it like a Grammy winning, track latin grammy and he's doing tons of drum work and production and we've done a bunch of gigs together and kind of hit it off as friends and i'm like hey man would you would you do this for me and i sent it off and you know a week later he sends me something back and i'm completely blown away i listen to it i'm like great done i get a text from him that goes hey man that's just a quick trial run i did uh what do you want changed i wrote him back going that's your version of a trial run. Yeah. I just did one pass at it. So it was, you know, I don't, don't change anything. It's perfect. Just send me the stems and uh, I'll start working with them. And once again, much like the other song, uh, I deleted all the electronic drums and uh, I think it, it really helped bring the song alive for me. <laughs> um, yeah, it really, really does. And is that Mark Sinclair playing bass on it again? No, I played bass on that. You played so, bass on this one. Yeah, so that's... This you is, and, is much more Jeff than... Yeah, and it's... I guess it's... In my mind, it's a departure for us, for you and I, James, and for oh, totally. the, the Mystic Fools. But, you know, I played it for some people, family and friends who have known us for a while. And, you know, I think to them, it's like, oh, sounds like you guys. I'm like, well, it is us. So I guess that makes sense. But in my mind, it's a different thing, you know? I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I tend to have a bit of a chameleon quality, I guess, to, to vocal stuff. It's like, I, I, I will grab, grab ideas from different places and just, and I just, I just wanted a different, wanted a different sound. I wanted a lighter sound. I wanted a happier, a happier yeah, sound than, than that kind of growly stuff that, that I tended to do on the, on the bluesier tunes. Right. Yeah, and I th- I think that came through, and like I think it was great, and it was fun to kind of hear, I guess, a more pop pop sound by and large to your yeah I guess to your to your vocals. It you know we're we're in the thick of it. It's hard to uh, completely articulate. Well, what is that? But I do remember recording it, us having just a ball working on it, and as much as there's loads of harmonies and loads of vocals, it 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 was it was lots of fun to do and relatively easy like i i did really very little editing of it of the actual vocals and no pitch correcting well we don't really do that we're not a band like that we we do it well or we re-record it pretty much um so yeah and even though there's lots of uh passes and lots of bits it, it was actually fairly easy to cobble together and have a really great sounding take or takes i suppose um, well, and, I got. I got to say, it's a lot. It's a lot of fun to have a uh, to have another weird recorded version of this band, uh, you, you know, floating around. It's it's uh, it's a 
it's just it it is such a uh it was such an important time in my life from a uh, from a goofing around and making music standpoint um that to, i'm uh, i'm really be, really pleased with yeah yeah absolutely and it's neat to see people's response i'm really curious how what the response will be as people get a chance to listen to it. Some of our old fans and and friends and who haven't heard from us really in a long time, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see their take on, on a new ish mystic rules. (laughs) New ish. I mean, I mean, this was recorded quite a, quite a while ago too. Like it's, it's another one that's, it's kind of a, a from the vaults kind of situation. Right. Um, But not as long. It's within the last, decade <laughs> yeah it wasn't it wasn't in the vault as, as long as falling off the yeah. edge but for us we're moving quickly <laughs> yeah <laughs> well it just it just it just goes to show you you've got a lot on your plate man you've been you've been doing a lot of stuff for the last 20 years and this is kind of you know the the things that kind of hang out on hang out on the shelf and and wait for you to have some free time to to play with them and and it's it's cool that they keep coming back and and yeah uh, and that things come to life i mean i who thought we would? Uh, who thought we would re-release the the record after all these years and get it on, uh, and and get it out on? Get digital. it up, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you you hounded me for years about it. I'm like, eh, I, I don't did. know. I did. you really did. You really did. Because I had and, people asking me when when it was going to be on iTunes, basically. And I and I'd always look and go, ah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I get to, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time, which I don't mind doing. But as you're saying, we're busy making music for a living so you have to find the time to do these and, projects just, that we love and at this point you've made probably i don't know five or six cents on the re-release so you know oh man we're up to even maybe five dollars i haven't looked in a while could even be five dollars <laughs> yeah please go to Bandcamp, not the streaming services kidding we'll listen to it anywhere yeah just just listen just listen just please throw, listen. Throw us, throw us in your Spotify playlist, whatever, you know, yeah. have fun. Um, um, anyway, this is, this has been a blast, Jeff. Thanks for, uh, thanks for calling me to jump on this and talk yeah, about tunes. Is- and, and we hope you, everybody out there, we hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Um, thanks for doing this, James and Guido. Thanks for uh, having us on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Cheers, man.
What a great question. Whatever happened to peace, love, and understanding? That's the Mystic Fools, James Woods on vocals, Jeff Lipka, songwriter, guitar, bass, and vocals, Marito Marquez on drums. What a great uh, song that's Get Lit. And I can't wait to see these guys uh, live at some point. Thanks for sharing uh, your songs with us and uh, for letting us listen into your intros. Those were, those were really unique and cool. And you can all follow the Mystic Fools on Facebook at Mystic Fools, on Twitter at Mystic Fools, or check out their tunes on Apple Music and Spotify. Search them up by Mystic Fools. I will have those links all in the podcast notes so you can check the Mystic Fools out and link up with them. Thanks for listening to the August podcast. I really appreciate that you come in and and tune in every month. And um, I'm enjoying this because of you, the listeners. Uh, See you in the fall, September. Woohoo! Stay safe, everybody.